Morning, Joe. George. Hi, Wei. Good morning. Not you, George. George. <laughs> George. <laughs> you too. Hi. And car, George. And car, George. Yes. Uh, I'm just saying good morning. Good morning. Uh, is Wayne on? Just got here, yes. Okay, good. And uh, Pat, um, how do I say that? Hobecker, do I see um, Pat Hobecker? Okay, that's the last person in the session. I don't see him yet. There's a Trincy John. Uh, I don't think I've seen him either. Um, okay, I have nine o'clock. Are we ready to go? Uh, let's wait probably one more minute. Uh, sorry, Joe, not that you lose a minute, but uh, all right. Yeah, uh, but you can bring up. Yeah, bring up your slide. Still looking for two other speakers for the session, so. <laughs> Can you see it? Yes. 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 Hmm. OK, at least the first two are here, Wayne. Um, OK. I'm trying to help track the other two. <laughs> so um, OK. Yeah, but, Good. Yeah, we can, we, we can uh, get, get started. Yeah. OK, well, welcome, everybody, to the uh, Thursday morning session. Uh, we have some interesting talks about uh, physics development. Um, the usual reminders, um, keep yourself muted at all times, um, unless you're called on to ask a question. Um, we'll answer questions at the end of the talk. You can use the raise hand function, um, and then we'll ask you to unmute and ask your question, or you can use Slido and the link will be provided. Uh, in the chat. Um, and I think that's basically what there is. So we're going to start off with uh, Joe Olson talking about physics development for the UFS. Take it away, Joe. 
All right, thanks, Wayne. And I'd like to thank all my co-authors here for their contributions. I'm going to be talking about a lot of things that I have little or nothing to do with, so you can bear with me on that. Um, basically, I want to overview our primary physics developments for the UFS, but I also want to convince the audience that there is a, there's a pretty robust holistic effort here ongoing to try to improve the representation of physics in a variety of different ways across a, a variety of different schemes and ultimately to reduce our systematic errors. And we're working towards a, not just a skillful model, but one that could also be used for scientific research. So today I'd just like to overview our development approach um, basically, and then touch upon five of the seven components of the system that I've listed here, and then overview some tentative uh, testing plans we have for the next three to six months and uh, summarize. So to start with the, our approach, uh, all of this is uh, done within the CP CCPP. We have a full adoption of the common community physics package, which forms the basis of all of our physics testing really. So everything is uh, typically performed within defined physics suites. If you wanna do a, a scheme compare, inner comparison, you have to uh, make a new suite definition file and configure it to uh, run everything else the same except for one particular scheme. That's pretty much how our testing is performed. Um, we are working towards a fully unified physics suite for all scales and applications. Uh, we do believe that this is achievable. And in some cases, it's quite simple, actually, like the gravity wave uh, drag component, for example. We'll talk about that later. In other cases, like the land surface model in microphysics, where we've targeted certain schemes that have been chosen, they're going to work towards, and we might have to add some other subcomponents from other uh, schemes that weren't chosen to make them more robust and ult ultimately um, develop them to fit better within uh, our overall suites. And then uh, in yet other cases like uh, the boundary layer and convection, I think there's still a lot of outstanding science questions to be solved that, that really need to be known before we can know what the final design is going to be known, what we're targeting for you know five, 10 years down the road. But while this is happening, uh, the physics development has adopted a kind of a two-stream approach where we do focus some of our efforts on improving the current operational schemes and some other efforts on research and designing for longer term scheme uh, and suite features. I'm gonna talk about some of the boundary layer development first. And um, there's basically four schemes that have been considered candidates um, all have some promising attributes. Um, most of the development though has been done in these top two schemes, the TK EDMF, which is currently using the GFS and the MYNN EDMF that's currently using RAP and HER. And Chun Chi will talk more about his scheme later on in the session. It's also a promising scheme. I'm gonna start with the MYNN changes and this is you know, focusing on stuff that's really just in, within the past uh, six months only. And uh, there's been some work to reduce the numerical noise that's been isolated to the stability functions. And the current configuration I'm most happy with anyway is uh, uh, just uses a level 2.5 stability functions for heat. And then uh, we derive the stability functions for momentum based off of a, um, some form of the a Prandtl number, which we've I've chosen to be uh, from Esau and Groshev, uh, but slightly modified to honor the original form of the MYNN, which had a Prandtl number of 0.76 in the unstable limit, but of course varied considerably um, with increasing Richardson number here. The new form will only increase with a slope factor of three. The original form had something closer to five. Um, but ultimately, this is a pretty fundamental change and it required a lot of other changes to the mixing lengths as well. To show you some quick results uh, from a Rufus retro, Rufus being the successor to the HER, that's our uh, regional three kilometer uh, operational product. Here's some results from a one week retro, looking at the wind speed, 12 hour forecast. You can see how this modification alone results in you know, uh, increased skill throughout the entire uh, troposphere, not just the boundary layer, and it, but it does help improve our high wind speed bias within the boundary layer. Similar for temperature, we see like a, an, uh, an improvement uh, relative to the control run, um, but mostly isolated to upper levels. Moving on to the TKE DMF boundary layer scheme, uh, we've added a, 
a wind shear turn basically to the to the BULAC mixing length, which ultimately reduces the mixing length in strong shear environments such as hurricanes. And here's an example of Hurricane Michael, where the black is a uh, you know the best estimates of uh, uh, the observed uh, central sea level pressure. You see a rapid deepening. Um, if you just compare the green against the blue, which is the updated version, you can see that it much better deepening rates. Uh, and although there's still a difference here, this is a pretty good result for a 12 kilometer uh, grid spacing uh, application actually. There's also been some work to uh, reduce, uh, to, uh, to overall suppress the PBL growth in the growing morning phase uh, by limiting the updraft overshoot a little bit, which ultimately reduces the entrainment. There's also been some improvement to uh, better simulate strong stable layers in the background diffusivity uh, changes. And I'll show some uh, example here. And this is a case study that's pointed out to us by the MEG group, um, with, which they consider this to be one of the primary forecast buffs of the current GFS. You can see the original version on the left um, that it struggles to maintain these really strong stable layers um, and commonly. So you get the dew point and temperature wrong. Commonly, the updated version certainly chips away, has that bias, and also improves the temperature uh, bias a little bit too. We also ran this case for the MYNN in, in the GFS suite. Uh, the pardon the, the axes are different here. It's more zoomed in, so you can better see the, the errors in the, in, the, in the structure here. But it does add skill to the GFS uh, version 16 suite as well. Um, even improves it more for, for dew point. Um, but overall, uh, we're seeing pretty good improvements in, in general uh, from both schemes. So it's, although it's still yet to determine, the, you know, too early to determine the optimal framework, you know, we don't know exactly which way we're gonna go for the long run yet. We're still assessing and developing at, at primarily at 12 and three kilometer grid spacing, but we can demonstrate significant improvements for both schemes and a wide variety of uh, regimes. And I do want to mention there's some code universalization underway. This is led by Laura Fowler. She's taken the first stab at this to, uh, to uh, universalize the MYNN EDMF. So even if uh, in the near term, if uh, CCPP is not adopted by um, WARF and MPAS, we can still have a module that fits directly into all these die cores, which will facilitate easier code management and possibly more frequent updates as well. The ball's in my court on that one um, uh, to complete that effort. Uh, moving on to the convection scheme, um, there's basically four schemes that are considered um, uh, candidates, but again, the top two are receiving most of the development here. Um, the scale where SAS is the one currently used in the in the operational GFS and the Grelf Rata scheme is used in the rapid refresh. So the Grill Freda scheme first, I mean, there, there's a lot of effort has been done on better coupling uh, to other schemes, like notably the double moment microphysics schemes and improved estimates of number concentration uh, tendencies, uh, improved coupling to atmospheric composition. There's been a lot of effort to evaluate full aerosol interactions. An example of this is on the right, uh, we're applying the mean precipitation efficiency as a function of time during this five day uh, period of the TWP ICE experiment for a, for a few different uh, pollution uh, scenarios being very clean in blue to very polluted in, in red. So you can see you get that overall, um, how it impact the precipitation efficiency within the convection scheme. There's a lot of other work on going too. There's uh, implementing different, uh, coupling to different chemistry options. Um, uh, we're exploring some machine learning techniques to improve certain aspects of the scheme. And we also want to refine the scale awareness to better uh, improve the convective evolution at higher, uh, at uh, much higher resolution. But the culmination of all these efforts uh, show that ultimately we can uh, demonstrate uh, at least improvements to the, a lot of some important bulk metrics like the uh, 500 millibar anomaly correlation differences. Um, if you just put the GF into the GFS suite, um, you can. It does actually improve the overall anomaly correlations in both the northern and southern hemisphere during this period. Not just during this period, this was actually extended out a full year. We saw similar improvements too. But during the same time, the scale of where SAS is uh, underwent uh, 
some development too. In order, and the focus here has been to reduce uh, the existing biases in GFS version 16, namely the underestimated CAPE, cold bias in the tropospheric profiles, particularly in the tropics, and improve the propagation of tropical Kelvin waves. Now, this just overviews um, some efforts that have been done to tackle each one of these biases, and I'll show some examples later on, but ultimately uh, some changes to the trigger function helps enhance the CAPE a bit. Some reduction in the rain evaporation helps reduce this cold bias, and the implementation of the cellular uh, automata uh, component into the scalar SAS helps improve the Kelvin waves. Um, an example of some of this here uh, for, a si for a simulation, here's a, the mean CAPE observed for the control um, uh, GFS version 16. And with the updated version of Scalaware SAS, you can see large areas where there's 100 to 300 uh, joules per Kelvin increase um, in the CAPE, which helps uh, certainly chip away at that uh, low CAPE bias. And also the, the reduction in the rain evaporation also helps reduce that cold bias we're seeing in the tropics as well. Um, onto the improvement of the tropical Kelvin waves, I mean, this was a topic in Cliff Mass's uh, talk yesterday. Um, this the importance of this cellular uh, automata uh, component is that it, it basically not only addresses the stochasticity, but also adds memory to the convection scheme. So basically it can evolve uh, convective elements over time, give them a, a life cycle and, uh, and allow for self-organization and stuff. And this, what this does is it really helps not only with the subgrid scale variability, but also with cross-grid convective organization. So, and here for this example, I believe it, this is hooked up to the trigger function. So uh, in order to assess uh, improvement of uh, propagation of tropical Kelvin waves, um, these so-called radon projection plots are basically plotting the variance of precipitation in the vertical against the wave phase speed uh, in the horizontal. And as you can see, uh, this is an ensemble of uh, simulations are in blue, the observed are in gray. And you can see that the control simulation is missing this maximum at about 15 meters per second here. But with the cellular automaton, you can you can get that Kelvin wave, get that shift more toward to match observations quite a bit. So I think that really, this is a good uh, data point that suggests that you know, uh, yeah, uh, coarse resolution mo models will struggle with this phenomenon. But with the proper way to address this, is really by including some memory uh, components of the parameterization. You can ultimately get these features at coarse resolution scales. So in summary, this is another good example of our two-stream approach where we've been chipping away a lot of the systematic biases and, and, and GFS version 16 of the scale where SAS. And at the same time, a lot of the efforts in the GF um, scheme have been to improve uh, double moment coupling, which is we hope to have a feature and we hope to have the double moment scheme into uh, in, uh, a global version here soon. So, um, and by improving the coupling to aerosols, you know, this is, uh, you know, looking further down the road, but we can already demonstrate uh, improved ACC scores as a result of some of this work. Moving on to the microphysics scheme, there's really only two schemes that are uh, used or under development right now. And it's the GFDL scheme, which is currently using the GFS, and the Thompson Aerosol Aware, which is currently using the RAP and HER. And, but we are developing it to try to get it to work more robustly in global applications. So. There's been some a lot of proposed modifications that are still uh, being tested here to improve not only the computational stability but also the, its efficiency. And I'm not going to go over all this for this talk, but uh, there's some promising work there. I'm going to move on to this uh, uh, improved surface aerosol emissions. So, point out that there was a, a bug removed fairly recently and which over amplified the surface emissions of water friendly aerosols. This bug fix was put into both WARF and CCPP as far as I'm, as far as I, I know. Uh, but we went taking a step further to improve the specification of surface emissions of aerosols by which were current, which were linked to the evolved atmospheric climatological values. And this is bad because when their flow significantly departs from climatology, you know, 
then your surface emissions are guaranteed to be incorrect, basically. So um, we're trying to specify them directly towards observed surface emissions using the go-kart. Here's, here's an example yet of the spatial distributions of some of them, of all the aerosol emissions from go-kart divvied up into water-friendly and, and ice-friendly uh, components. So if you run the Thompson microphysics scheme for a full month in the control uh, version, and just analyze the last day, a 24-hour average at day 31, you'll see that there's a lot of aerosols at high latitudes. Um, but if you replace the emissions with this uh, go-kart derived emissions, you can see that there's a lot more, uh, they, they can be a lot uh, higher over certain areas, over the source regions and fire regions. And there's a lot less actually uh, in, the, in the polar areas, but, and you see even a little bit more down here in, uh, in the southern hemisphere storm track. And of course, you, we get some ice from the aerosols instead of just depleting it over time. So if you take the difference of these two and, and these two, you'll get uh, these two plots here on the left. And this really highlights uh, that reduction of aerosols at high latitudes and the increase in the storm track. And this directly does Im impact the precipitation, uh, at least mildly for this case. Uh, so. You get an increase in precipitation where there is a reduction in aerosols and conversely uh, a decrease in precipitation where there's a, an increase, uh, which, which makes sense. Um, it also impacts the downward shortwave radiation at the surface. So and so this might be more due to the direct impact, but there might maybe some indirect impact here too. But overall, there's going to be a reduction in where, anywhere between uh, 10, 40 watts per meter squared in certain areas, it so looks like primarily over the water, but not solely over the water. So uh, in summary, we've done a lot of work on trying to improve the computational stability for longer time steps. I'm not gonna, I didn't highlight any of that here, but the, the surface aerosol emissions have been improved, at least be more physical. I think we're still analyzing them to make sure that the, the magnitudes of these fluxes are, are, uh, are good. But um, overall, I think that this is a step in the right direction these results do impact the precipitation and radiation, so it may require some further tuning, but this won't go into the next version of GFS anyway. We have a little bit of time there. The near-term plans are to, are to use the prescribed MERA-2 aerosols for interaction with uh, radi radiation, but um, uh, we are considering using this new go-kart derived emissions uh, for a single chemistry member of the GEFS ensemble. Moving on to the radiation. Um, Basically, all the global and the uh, regional schemes all use our TMG right now. We're trying to update to our, our, our TMGP, uh, an effort led by the, the Pincus Group, uh, for reasons I'll go over on the next slide. But we're all at the same time, we're looking at maybe a, a longer term approach to work with some machine learning algorithms uh, to fully replace the radiation scheme. So. Um, the improved physics here I want to point out with our TMGP has to do with Im uh, improved treatment of uh, uh, scattering of long wave radiation by cloud by the clouds and uh, uh, better approximate the, the heating rate response to changes in surface temperature between the radiation calls. It basically uses a, a more modern spectroscopic data which it's trained on and um, improved software allows more flexible coupling to Cloud, clouds and radiation, and it's more GPU ready. However, for CPU applications, it looks like it's still a little bit slower than our TMG. So we're, we're still trying to uh, work out that kink. But uh, yeah, the importance of the updated spectroscopic data is highlighted here in the left uh, figure. Um, we're here and plotting errors in the short wave flux at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface on bottom for both our TMG and our TMGP. As you can see, the errors are, are much larger for, the systematic errors are much larger for the RTMG uh, compared to the bench line, uh, a benchmark that's a line by line model that, that's, uh, that uses more up to date uh, spectroscopic data. Uh, and also for a wide variety of atmospheric conditions here, we're testing over. So as you can see, the RTMGP is a lot lower errors because it's really trained off of that same updated spectroscopic data. And on the right, I'm showing impact of the physics innovations, um, specifically 
the uh, improves the improvements to the scattering of long wave radiation by ice clouds, which ultimately uh, gives a little bit of increased downwelling long wave radiation at the flux, particularly at, at higher latitudes. So because radiation schemes are so expensive, they're called every you know, 10, 15 time steps or so, we are still experimenting with some machine learning techniques and pretty good promising results so far. Um, as near perfect reliability and low bias. Now, if you plot here the, uh, the net uh, radiation observed versus what's predicted here for a few different cloud scenarios, namely the multi-cloud, no cloud, and single layer cloud, scenarios, you can see the bias is pretty small overall. And the overall uh, distribution of uh, predicted uh, net radiation uh, matches fairly well with the observed frequency. And since this is about a thousand times faster than our TM, we can really run this every single time step and the model would still run faster. However, still needs a little bit of work. There's a uh, work going to make the simulator a little bit more vertical grid agnostic and then incorporate the impacts of aerosols and precipitation. And uh, then we'll begin building a, a long wave emulator. So this will be tested in future versions of the UFS. And there's a paper already submitted for publication. So this is another good example of our two stream approach. You know, we're updating to a more contemporary uh, uh, scheme, a still traditional uh, a radiation scheme, but more contemporary in its physics and data an updated software. We're still working on the efficiency uh, problem, but uh, in the long run, these machine, lear machine learning based emulators seem to be very promising. They may be able to fully incorporate the impacts of 3D effects and, and implicitly handle the cloud overlap assumptions as well. However, this is not yet available in CCPP or any other modeling framework for that matter yet. Moving on to the gravity wave physics development, there's a, the basic goal here is to merge our GSL suite that Mike Toy talked about yesterday into what was already called the unified gravity wave physics. We're trying to actually make it the true unified gravity wave physics after this merger and make it scale aware uh, for any application. So like I said, Mike did talk a little bit, little bit about this yesterday, so I'm not going to belabor you with too much detail here, but there we do employ two traditionally used components that are used in a lot of other drag suites by other operational defenders, uh, namely the large scale gravity wave and the flow blocking drag. And these are primarily for course resolution only. So they taper off by the time you get down to about uh, five kilometers. So for higher resolution applications, we basically uh, uh, we implemented uh, the small scale gravity wave and the form drag. And these can be taken down to one kilometer grid spacing, but a course can also be used at a uh, course resolution applications as well. And in the future, we were, were trying to basically unify this large and small scale gravity wave into what we're calling a, a, a four year uh, formulation that basically represents all the different types of waves that may exist in a certain uh, atmospheric regime given underlying uh, subgrid scale terrain characteristics. So the scheme is written such that it can be flexibly just use all any components of the original scheme, uh, the original large scale and blocking drag, this non-stationary component that primarily impacts the stratosphere and above, and, uh, and our, uh, our new components as well. So you can configure it a, a variety of different ways. Here's some results for a variety of different configurations. And uh, you can see um, compared to the GFS default in black, overall uh, the red is the version of, of the unified gravity wave physics without any of the, the new um, GSL components. The green starts activating the small scale on top of the graphic wave, and the, the blue basically uses the entire GSL suite. As you can see, overall improvements really start to show up later on in the forecast. There's a slight degradation earlier on. Biggest improvements show up in 10 meter wind speed, especially over the west conus here, where it matches the observations quite well from early on in the forecast and it's a little bit high later on. Four so minutes. Summary, I'll be done in one or two. So, in summary, that we can demonstrate overall improvements in a lot of uh, key scores here, but we're still assessing and developing at 
primarily at 12 and three kilometers. Uh, but uh, as Mike pointed out, it's already implemented in WARF version 4.3. And special thanks to Mike Duda for his help there. And we intend to keep updating this as it evolves within the UFS. The tentative test plans uh, for the next three to six months. Uh, we're, we're, we've already finalized the control simulations, but we now we're going to go back and 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 uh, run some simulations to, for comparison with uh, using the new schemes one at a time. And uh, we got to test further test out the the revisions to the current schemes already used. And then we'll do some combined testing and final tuning. After that configuration is known, we'll start testing in fully coupled mode with the with the ocean, and then uh, undoubtedly have to do some more tuning. And then, at, at, but during this process, we'll continue to uh, develop the, uh, the experimental candidate schemes as well. So my final slide here, I just want to convince everybody that you know, basically all groups involved in this have really expanded our scope. So we're no longer just regional or global. We're really truly doing all scales now. We are united in the fact that we're going to work towards a unified physics suite, but we uh, some components are going to take longer than others uh, for you know good science reasons. But all components are under uh, intense development. Some of these schemes are already integrated into a war for MPAS, further scheme universalization and or full adoption of CCPP would help. Um, but uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, just thank a lot of our collaborators from a uh, variety of different institutions. And thanks, I'll take questions. Okay, uh, we do have a couple of questions. I think you answered the first one right there in the, in the top of your uh, summary, which is that uh, the plan is to, in fact, make the model work everywhere all the time. Um, there's a specific question about MYN and EDMF and GF uh, and the Gralfredis shallow scheme at three kilometers. Um, and I know that's kind of a sensitive question. Do you want to say something about that or do you want me to? <laughs> I could say, I mean, like uh, there is an overlap in physics not a complete overlap, though. Um, I think right now the overlap is uh, um, is minimized because I think uh, a lot of the Grelfreda shallow cumulus scheme is it seems to be more active over water, where the mass flux component in the EDMF uh, and the MYNN seems to be underactive. So they kind of complement each other right now, luckily, you know. So, but I think ultimately. Things should be done once, only once, and, and done once correctly, you know. So I think that we're, we are working towards uh, making sure all the physics is uh, going to happen in one place, and, uh, you know, but we're just not quite there yet. We're close. Okay, and I see Dave Stauffer has his hand raised. Dave, can you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes, I, I was, uh, in terms of speed up, you, uh, you alluded to machine learning radiation scheme, and I just wondered, do you think that's something that's going to be able to be used in, in real-time forecasts, or does it have a lot of training required to use that? Uh, again, I'm intrigued by this machine learning. Uh, is it a deep neural net, or what type of method is being used in machine learning for radiation? Uh, it's a modified unit. Um, I'm not an expert of this field, so I don't even know what that means, to be honest. Uh, but, I mean, this is... This is something that's still early on. I mean, I think that it's it can prove like near perfect reliability in a single column model mode right now, but it has it really hasn't undergone a lot of testing in the 3D framework yet. Uh, so I don't think uh, time will tell. As long as we can achieve full reliability, no crashes, and, it, and it's got to be obviously trained over an extensive data set that handles every condition observed on, on the planet. Um, and uh, if so, it can it could be made robust enough to be used in real time. That's the that's absolutely the goal here. We expect it to happen at some point. I mean, I, I'm just concerned about those rare events. You know, would you be able to uh, represent those with these machine learning methods that are based upon training data over even over many decades? Sometimes you get anomalous events that aren't in the training data. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think the the machine learning community is getting smarter about adding some sorts of 
constraints are, are better at extrapolating than they have been in the past, where it, it, was, a, it was an obvious killer, uh, result, resulting in crashes, if not you know, major biases. But I think it, there's been a lot of improvement on that aspect. I, again, I'm not an expert in that field, so I, I would be embellishing a bit already, I think. Oh, wow, a thousand times speed Okay, um, I think we should. I think we should move on to the next speaker. Um, thanks, Joe. And our next speaker is George Bryan, and he's going to be talking about using LES for um, PBL parameterization evaluation. Uh, Joe, I think you need to stop uh, sharing your screen. Oh, got it. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So give me a shout out if you can't see my slides. No, it's there. Cool, thanks. Uh, so this talk focuses on the uh, PBL, the lowest uh, few kilometers of the of the atmosphere. And um, a few background slides just to make sure everybody's on the same page and thinking about this the same way. There's two primary ways we simulate the planetary boundary layer in our community, in the atmospheric science community. One is, is through what's called large eddy simulation, which is essentially you integrate the governing equations with uh, eddy resolving resolution. So that means resolution small enough to resolve the uh, primary energy containing eddies. And so on the bottom left here is a nice uh, three-dimensional figure of uh, vertical velocity from a LES of the, the heated boundary layer. Uh, from Mung and Sullivan, a uh, good review article in the Encyclopedia of Atmospheric Sciences if you want to mo learn more about LES. So few people use LES in our community because it's just expensive. You need grid spacing less than 100 meters. You need time steps less than one second. Uh, it's just very costly. Um, on the right here uh, shows how you, even though these simulations aren't widely used in weather prediction, you can use them in a diagnostic sense. You can uh, determine things like on the bottom here is a vertical heat flux profile. Uh, which you'll see a little bit of in some some following slides. And the second way in which we simulate the PBL, and the, the most common way, especially for this community, is to use a PBL parameterization. That's where you integrate a simplified set of equations to represent the effects of those small-scale turbulence on the mean flow. And so here's a couple uh, different equations from, from two different studies with the usual eddy diffusivity terms, counter gradient flux terms. Uh, YSU has an entrainment flux term. These schemes are always used, uh, are almost always used, and I mean, your model grid spacing is greater than a kilometer. So it's, you know, all numerical weather prediction and climate models have some form of planetary boundary layer parameterization. Uh, and here's just some pictures uh, showing um, results from uh, some of the studies that have developed these schemes. Um, so the, um, the goal in this study is to actually you know, do kind of what I suggested before, so to use the LES to evaluate the PBL and then hopefully improve your your weather forecasts. And so, you know, it's a multi-step process. You run the large eddy simulation, you calculate some diagnostics from that simulation that are uh, useful for your PBL scheme, and then you compare those results to what the PBL scheme does and uh, even look and come to more in depth and, and try to get the, the right results for the right reasons too. And this is not a new idea. This is something that, you know, has a long history of people using a LAS to evaluate PBL schemes. In fact, I think the first example of this was probably Deerdorf in 1972. Uh, nice study I, I learned about while I was doing this study of IOT et al. 96, I think was published in, in Quarterly Journal, did something similar to what I'm doing. And that's um, to do this uh, type of study in a broad range of conditions. So, you know, typically uh, or oftentimes you'll see you know, people will evaluate their PBL scheme in one or, or two environments, you know, for cases that they have data on or that they're interested in. And, the goal here is to is to do this in a, in a wide range of conditions from unstable boundary layers to stable boundary layers, cases with just scattered cumulus clouds and, you know, uh, thick prevalent stratocumulus clouds and, and more. We're running in hurricane conditions also, for example. And also we're using, you know, higher resolution LES than people in the past. And that's just a, a, a function of uh, more computing power that's available in recent years. Uh, so this uh, project, uh, for lack of a better idea, I'll call it the PBL evaluation project. It started about six months ago. It's just something I was, I've been kind of working on on the side as a, uh, as a you know, curiosity driven kind of research. And it, it, it was motivated by several projects in NCAR's M-Cubed laboratory. Um, M-Cubed, uh, the, 
staff uses uh, several different types of PBL schemes and you know, some questions came up about, you know, should we all be using a single PBL scheme like uh, NOAA is, is moving towards and uh, wanted some more information that was available in the literature. So I started working on this project, this project, and it's a work in progress. Uh, the methodology is, is uh, uh, designed just based on things I had lying around and could do relatively easily, but uh, based on things I've learned, I might change some of the methodology in the future. All conclusions here are preliminary, and uh, one of the reasons I'm presenting it at this workshop is that input and feedback are, are, are welcome. Uh, so I'm going to focus primarily here on six different cases. Uh, three of the cases uh, do not have moisture or clouds. They're canonical uh, boundary layer flows. In fact, uh, uh, going from unstable to neutral to, to stable conditions, you see at the top here. And these are the grid spacing I was, I'm using uh, for the LES. You can see the stable case is quite high resolution, two meter grid spacing. And some nice pictures in the bottom showing what these simulations look like. This is vertical velocity, um, about a tenth of the way up the boundary layer from the surface. You can see the different types of structures that are produced in these different types of environments. I'm studying three cases with clouds. Um, the first one is a uh, often studied oceanic stratocumulus case from DICOMS shown in the bottom left. This now is a vertical cross section where the shading is cloud water and uh, the contours show vertical velocity. Uh, second case I've been looking at a lot more recently is the uh, RICO sh uh, shallow cumulus, uh, precipitating shallow cumulus case. And some, the third case I'm not going to talk about today is uh, shallow cumulus over land with a time evolving uh, surface fluxes, uh, sort of trying to get at the diurnal cycle. So that gives you a sense of the kind of cases um, we're looking at in this study. Uh, getting to the nitty gritty about the methodology, I'm actually using a, a model called CM1. It stands for Cloud Model 1 uh, for, for this study. Um, if you're not familiar with CM1, it's a code developed in NCAR for, for more idealized type of research. You can't use it for weather prediction. It's kind of used for theoretical and uh, uh, high resolution uh, research studies. So why CM1 and not WARF? It turns out there's more uh, of these so-called test cases, like the ones I just described, that, for example, the DICOMS uh, model and comparison test case. So it would have taken you know, a lot more time to put to code these schemes up in WARF, but in CM1, we had them ready to go. And so that's why, you know, as I said, six months ago, I started playing around with this. Uh, CM1 is a simpler vertical coordinate than WARF. It has a height coordinate of pressure, makes analysis easier, more straightforward. And then there's a lot of diagnostic output built into CM1 that runs during the model run and uh, saves time in the post-processing. You don't have to wait for a lot of uh, analysis to be done. It's all ready to go as soon as the model finishes running. All these cases include for the LES, uh, run on approximately 200 by 200 by 200 grid points. Uh, some cases have 500 cubed. Uh, one thing to point out is uh, these test cases, I'm just following what was done in the literature, but usually I'm running at least twice the resolution of the original study. So that's what I meant earlier when I said I was using higher resolution than previous cases. This helps uh, uh, improve the statistics, uh, turbulent statistics in a lot of these cases. The domains are tiny, you know, they only extend by five kilometers in the horizontal, but they're, they're big enough to resolve the uh, turbulent eddies that, that do most of the work in the boundary layer. And just for people that are interested, the subgrid scale model is the Deerdorf uh, TK scheme. This is a pretty standard scheme to use in LES. And just to be clear, there's no PBL parameterization in LES mode. You're using the model's governing equations to handle the turbulence. For the PBL scheme evaluation, um, running CM1 in single column mode, uh, these are some of the schemes I've been looking at. The ones highlighted in red here are the ones I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I have looked at the GFS uh, codes, the one that was running last year and the one that's now running this year, and also uh, a scheme called CLUB. It's in NCAR's uh, uh, CESM model, um, which I'm not going to talk about here today. And then the methodology specifically, again, why CM1, why not run it in WARF? Well, again, these test cases are all set up and ready to go in CM1. And also, you know, we have more diagnostic output where, uh, you know, I wrote code to pull terms like uh, you know the heat flux is directly out of the PBL code, so you don't have to analyze them after the fact, and you can do them consistently with the code itself. Uh, you're running these in single column mode, and what that means, you have one grid point in X, one grid point in Y, and then you know an arbitrary NK number of grid points in the vertical. Um, what I'm going to show here today, highlighted in red, is the you run that single column model with the same resolution as the LES, just for simplicity, and also just to see if the schemes can do things like resolve uh, or reproduce sharp features, as you'll see in a moment. I, I have run lower resolution 
versions of the single column model with uh, roughly 20 grid points over like the lowest four kilometers or something like that. It's closer to how these schemes are actually run in reality, uh, but they're a little bit more complicated to analyze because then you have to down filter the LES results to, for fair comparison, things like that. And you know, to be clear, we're running with a PBL parameterization in this case, but without the aforementioned uh, Deerdorf SGS model. There's no horizontal scales in these single column models, but for the scale, scale aware codes, uh, like uh, newer versions of MYNN, for example, you need to specify a horizontal grid spacing you know, for the purposes of you know, whether the scale aware terms are on or off. So uh, just arbitrarily, I put in 20 kilometers. So I'm running this in kind of a mesoscale model type mode. And then uh, just to temper scale back expectations a little bit, if you're expecting me to tell you which PBL scheme it, you, know, you should use for your work, you know, I'm not going to do that. Um, none of these schemes stand out as best uh, across these range of environments, as you'll see in a moment. Um, some of them work better than others in different environments. The goal here is actually, you know, not to determine the, the best scheme or to guide future work. It's kind of more to point out what schemes can do now and, and some, suggest some simple improvements that can be input into MP, WARF and MPAS now. So let me show you some examples here. I started off by looking at the MYJ scheme. This is used by uh, quite a few people in the M cubed uh, lab at NCAR for, for real-time weather prediction. Um, this is the convective boundary layer case. So you specify the surface heat flux uh, and let the boundary layer grow over time. And you can see on this left here is the PBL depth over time. The black in all these plots is going to be results from LES. And you can see that the boundary layer is just not growing in time with MYJ. You can see in the middle plot here, vertical profile of potential temperature. Uh, you can see that uh, lower boundary layer depth quite clearly. And it's, it's more than a Kelvin cooler than the LES results after only six hours of model integration. And the right says the vertical profile of heat flux and it shows you why the scheme's not doing well in this environment. It does okay near the surface uh, because that's specified. Uh, the bottom up diffusion is handled well, but then you see at the top of the boundary layer, the, you know, it, the MOIJ results in the red just zero out. Uh, it doesn't have the negative heat flux near the top of the boundary layer. And the reason it doesn't is that there's no counter gradient term or, or entrainment flux term or mass flux component, different boundary layer schemes handle this type of ter term differently. Uh, that allows you to some of this top-down diffusion of uh, potentially warmer air above the boundary layer down into the boundary layer. And so that's why there's a bias, uh, a low bias in the MIJ compared to the LES. It doesn't have this top-down diffusion of this entrainment of warm air down into the boundary layer from above. And for that reason, if we ran moisture with this case, there'd be too much water vapor in the PBL in this case. One more case with MIJ, it just, it really is, doesn't do well in these type of idealized tests, which is odd considering it, it does fairly well in uh, real data cases, um, suggesting there might be counterbalancing biases in the WARF model. But here's an example showing the stable boundary layer where the MYJ scheme just turns off after a little more than an hour. Um, you can see the uh, wind profile here. Um, the jet is much lower than the LES produces. And uh, the reason is that the, the TKE just turns off and the MYJ has this weird I think it's like a minimum value of TKE of about 0 0.1, which is probably too high for this stable boundary layer. Uh, also, I'm not showing you here, but the MYJ can be quite noisy and unstable at high resolution. It's just a code that's really optimized for, for coarse resolution and mesoscale model usage, I think. Uh, moving on to the YSU and Shin Hong schemes. Uh, you may not be familiar with uh, Shin Hong. It's kind of a successor to the, uh, to the YSU code. Uh, they do very well in this case. In fact, uh, you can see my, my technical term here I, I, at the bottom. YSU and Shin Hong rock the daytime boundary layer. Very technical conclusion. Uh, it's even hard to see the black line uh, in these plots because the Shin Hong in particular is right on top of the LES results. And uh, the reason it does it slightly better than YSU in this case is it does a better job of predicting the, the minimum value of the uh, negative heat flux near the top of the boundary layer. Uh, quite impressive what... Uh, uh, YSU, and in fact, that's uh, that's mislabeled. The red is YSU, and the purple is Shinhong. Uh, the stable boundary layer. Um, these schemes actually struggle with the stable boundary layer. You can see they mix out the uh, inversion um, at around 200 meters above the surface. The jet is a little bit too high and and too diffuse. This is one of the reasons I ran this at high resolution. I want to see if these models could reproduce the the sharp jet profile in this uh, nighttime boundary layer. You'll see the YSU and Shin Hong schemes produce pretty much the same results 
Um, and that's because um, in stable conditions, they're both using the exact same code. It's, uh, it's a mixing length model with a constant specified mixing length of 30 meters. And this is, this is pretty crude. Um, I think people who work on boundary layers know that uh, you know, mixing lengths are, you can't just specify one constant value for all types of flow. That needs to, modif needs to change based on the local conditions. One thing that's weird is that diagnosed PBL depth is right hugging the ground in this case. And this has to do with essentially a quirk in how they diagnose PBL depth. It essentially neglects the effects of shear. Um, if you want to know more about this, you can talk to me offline. But Dave Nolan at University of Miami drew my attention to this kind of uh, quirk in the PBL depth diagnostic in, in YSU and Shinhong. Uh, the Stratocumulus case is really interesting. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll cover this really quickly. If you focus on the red and the purple, that's the default YSU and Shinhongs. They have this uh, cool bias near the top of the boundary layer. Um, this is because um, if you look at the eddy profile, it's here in the bottom left. Um, they're not doing enough mixing near the top of the boundary layer in the, in the bottom parts of the Stratocumulus cloud. And so the specified, uh, or it's not specified, the radiative cooling tendencies um, just uh, are overactive and, and cool the air way too much compared to the LES, way too much cloud that's too thick. Um, but YSU has an interesting option, um, which was added by Rob Favell and one of his students um, you know, four years ago or so. You can turn this on by, uh, there's a nameless flag called top-down PBL mix, and it, it helps a lot. It, it, it basically increases the eddy diffusivity um, in clouds uh, near the top of the boundary layer. And you can see when I turn that on, the results in blue are very much closer to large eddy simulation. So this suggests that this scheme should probably be on by default in WARF and, and MPAS. I, by the way, I've run this on and off for a number of these cases. It seems, to, in my experience, it has no negative effects. It has only a positive impact. Um, so that's why I said it should probably be on by default, at least based on these limited simple tests. So three that's minutes, Jimmy. OK, I'll wrap up pretty quick. The, the last code I'm going to talk about is MYNN. And as Joe Olson alluded to, there's been sort of a lot of development on MYNN over the years. And it, results depend greatly on which version of the code you use. Big change added uh, in WARF 3.8 was the addition of a mass flux scheme or an EDMF code. Well, one thing I will point out that uh, the versions that the MYNN I've looked at are um, one of the few PBL codes that works well for this stable PBL case. Uh, here's some results here. It's certainly not perfect, but TKA profiles are the closest match um, of any of the codes I've looked at. We've identified quite a few things, uh, suggestions for improvement. We've been in contact with the GSL folks about some of these, like modifying the uh, length scales near the surface to improve hurricane wind profiles. Joe talked about the noisy eddy viscosity profiles. And for high resolution versions of of MOINN, the mass flux scheme turns remains off. Uh, I'd actually suggest a, a change in the way the mass flux scheme is, is triggered, if you will. Um, some results for the RICO case uh, on the left here. Again, the black is LES. The red is the wharf, recent WARF version of MOINN. It, it just lifts the uh, uh, trade wind inversion too high, but this MPAS version 6.1 version of the code does the opposite. This drove me mad, so I, uh, I started modifying the code, spent a couple of weeks on this. One of the things I found is that uh, if I turned back on a limit on the Prandtl number in stable clouds, I got much better results. Um, and also modified the criterion for the activation of the mass flux code to work in slightly unstable conditions as opposed to only very unstable conditions. And there's some other minor stuff I can talk to, to Joe Olson and company with offline. This is my last, last slide. So some next steps, um, possibly run higher resolution benchmark simulations, you know, with grids of order 1000 cubed. Um, this is primarily for the benefit of the, of the shallow cumulus and stratocumulus cases, which need high resolution to resolve the terminal eddies within the clouds. We might perhaps implement these changes into WARF and MPAS, but somebody needs to evaluate these modifications in real data cases first. That's not my forte, and I haven't really done that. Other PBL schemes I'm kind of interested in the EPS scheme that's going to be talked about um, in the next talk after me. And then uh, CLUB um, is in the, as I said, is an NCARS climate model. Might feature in uh, the Earthworks project that Bill Scamarock talked about earlier today. We'll definitely, definitely given that code a, a closer look. And then, you know, if you want to help work with me on these, uh, in this work, send me an email. There's my email address down there at the bottom. Um, so that's it. And uh, back to you, Wayne.
Thanks, George. Uh, I think we have time for basically one question. Um, and, uh, Cliff Mask asks, uh, how do you know the LAS simulation is correct? Well, that's that's kind of a philosophical question, but uh, take a take yeah, a whack. I mean, the word at, at the top here is is the appropriate word to use. It's a benchmark. You know, we're not saying it's correct. We're saying okay, this this has fewer uncertainties, and so let's evaluate um, how well we can reproduce the simulation that has you know fewer unknowns. That's that's really what we're doing here. And yeah, um, I. I should probably use more correct language throughout my talk. I try to use language like, you know, compared to LES, you know, if something's cooler than the LES. It doesn't mean it's right. It means it's, uh, it's not matching our benchmark like we expect it to. That's, that's sort of the language you need to use in studies like this. Okay, thanks. I think we should move on. You can read the Slido uh, questions and respond to folks individually if you want to. Um, so our next talk is Chunxi Zhang talking about um, the e Epsilon scheme, which has been mentioned a couple of times already. Um, and Chen Chi, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Oh. Um, I may have a problem to share my screen. So, do you, do you want me to try? Yes, yes, please. Can that you looks see good. My yeah. Okay. Uh, Wayne, can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Yeah, just tell me to how when to um, forward a slide, okay? Trinzi, yeah, oh, you tell okay, me. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, can I start here? Okay, um, my title is the uh, Epsilon PBR scheme in the Wolf model. Um, next slide, please. So at the beginning, I'll, I will give a brief introduction to um, this scheme. Then I will uh, evaluate this scheme uh, along with the other PBL schemes over the um, South, Southeast Pacific and uh, South Great Plains. And in the end, I will give a summary. Next slide, please. So why the Yepron scheme? First, the mixing length is uh, no longer required in the Yepron scheme, uh, which significantly reduces the number of lines of code. Um, second, um, the epsilon scheme is the first scheme in the Wolf model that uh, uses epsilon for, I mean, the prognostic epsilon for uh, the closure of the TKE equation. Um, third, um, the epsilon scheme can better retain memory effects in length and the velocity scales uh, when surface condition changes. Um, next slide, please. So um, there are uh, four equations and uh, four variables uh, need to solve. Um, the first equation is for um, TKE, and the second equation is for TKE dissipation rate epsilon, and the third equation is for um, the vertical mixing coefficient uh, for momentum, and the fourth one is for the mixing uh, coefficient uh, for heat and uh, moisture. So here, um, both uh, TK and uh, epsilon are advected in the dynamic core. So C1 to C5 are the coefficients. And uh, we set the minimum allowed uh, values for E and epsilon. And the background uh, diffusivity um, for momentum is set to 0.1 and uh, uh, for heat and moisture is set to 0.01. So here, um, a few iterations with smaller time steps are necessary for uh, numerical stability uh, inside the code um, when the time step is very large. Next slide, please. 
So here, um, the alpha is the reciprocal of the Prandtl number, and it is a function of the uh, gradient, um, gradient um, Richardson number. And the, the um, Boysenton is in, uh, enhanced in the clouds uh, with this function. Next slide, please. The um, lower boundary, con boundary conditions uh, for TK and epsilon are calculated based on the um, sort of similarity theory. And uh, the upper boundary conditions uh, at the model top are set to um, zero. Next slide, please. So we added a non-local term for um, heat and the moisture. And uh, this is uh, very similar to the ones and used in uh, the YSU scheme. Next slide, please. And we'll also um, include uh, TKE dissipative um, heating term in, um, in the code. Next slide, please. Okay, let's start to evaluate those schemes. So, um, this is the domain for the Southeast Pacific. And uh, the red box is the region for evaluation. And uh, um, please pay attention to um, those zone one, zone two, and uh, uh, near coastal station called Ikiki. So the grid spacing is three kilometers, and there are 51 vertical levels and 21 levels below 2.5 kilometers. Um, we continuously run uh, wolf point 4.10 uh, uh, from October 24th to November 15th. Then we compare the E epsilon scheme with YSU, MYN, and the UW schemes. So here actually um, we use the Xing Hong uh, scale with Xing Hong schemes. So we just named it the YSU here. Uh, next slide, please. So those are uh, vertical cross sections for TKE and the EDR. EDR uh, is defined here. Uh, and those two variables are uh, meridionally averaged between uh, 18 and 22 uh, degree north. So both TKE and the EDR are gradually uh, increased from east to west and gradually um, decreased near surface to up levels. Next slide, please. Those are the distribution of the uh, TK and the EDR at different levels. So you can see here it's from around 100 to around 700 meters. So start around 500 meters this line, uh, both TK and uh, EDR start to hit the walls. Uh, those are the uh, minimum allowed values we set um, in the code. Next slide, please. Uh, those are the uh, vertical cross sections for cloud mixing ratio and a, a virtual potential temperature. And also um, meridionally uh, average between uh, 18 and 22 degree north. So for uh, both uh, e the epsilon scheme and the y scheme um, have a, a very similar performance as you can see from these two um, panels. And the NYN um, scheme has a, a low uh, cloud mixing ratio. And both MYN and the uh, UW scheme have a um, higher mixed layer. Next slide, please. Those are the um, PPO heights diagnosed by each scheme. Uh, clearly the YSU and the UW scheme uh, has a very, very low um, PBL heights, I think those heights are more likely um, the cloud-based heights. 
Next slide, please. The top panel is for um, cloud top height. Um, the M1N scheme slightly over predicted the um, cloud top height. And the uh, YSU and the Epsilon scheme uh, under predicted the cloud top height. And the UW scheme has the best performance. The lower panel is for liquid water path. Uh, the MYN scheme has the uh, um, best performance and all other three PBL schemes uh, un, uh, has a um, lower liquid water path. Next slide, please. Uh, those are the vertical profiles for the potential temperature, specific humidity, wind speed over zone one, zone two, and Ikiki respectively. Overall, the UW scheme um, has the best performance and uh, uh, very, very close to the observations. And the, the M1NM scheme slightly um, over predicted the inversion layer heights, especially for over zoom one. And uh, both the uh, Epsilon scheme and uh, YOS, YSU scheme have a um, much lower inversion lane height, and which uh, mean the uh, both scheme has a uh, um, insufficient mix, uh, vertical mixing. Next slide, please. Those are the tendencies for uh, from the PBL schemes for uh, PT, QV, and the wind speed over um, zoom one, zoom two, and the Kiki, respectively. I expect that, um, I mean, in spite of that, the uh, YCU scheme and the e April scheme um, have very similar uh, vertical profiles. Uh, the tendencies for these two schemes are very different, as you can see from um, those figures. And uh, um, the UW scheme, the actual uh, tendencies from the UW scheme is 10 times larger than the value you saw here. This is very strange, but you know that the UW scheme um, has the best uh, vertical profiles. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this is the domain for the uh, South Great Plains. Uh, there's a station, I mean, observation of the site at uh, uh, Lamont, and uh, we have different observations. Um, the Great Spacing is also on uh, three kilometers and uh, um, there are 51 vertical levels and 21 um, vertical levels um, that are below 2.5 kilometers. And uh, we still use uh, 4.0. Uh, and we uh, select five consecutive days. And uh, uh, we did five runs for each scheme. And each run uh, integrated uh, 36 hours. And the first 12 hours, um, were discarded. Um, and also compare on this scheme with the YSU, MY, and the UW schemes. Next slide, please. The left side is a TK at the lowest model level. Uh, clearly, the uh, E epsilon scheme did a very good job com compared uh, with the observation. The right side is a TK and EDR on um, time height space. Again, um, the Zeppelin scheme did a good job and uh, except that uh, the values at daytime are uh, higher than the observations. But you know, there's also uh, not necessarily, it's very accurate for the observation. Um, next slide, please. Those are the surface variables. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, 
all PPL schemes has uh, uh, performed very um, similarly. And uh, uh, probably it's because we used the same uh, land surface model and uh, surface layer scheme. Uh, but you can see here, all PPL scheme have uh, uh, have a high U star uh, biases, and uh, all PPL scheme have uh, predicted the wind speed, 10 meter wind speed uh, overnight and uh, uh, night nights. Okay, next slide, please. Five minutes. Okay. Those are vertical profiles uh, uh, for uh, PTQV wind speed at 7 a.m., 1 p.m., 7 p.m., and 1 a.m., respectively. So we, here we check those um, convective boundary layers. So you can see at 1 p.m., all um, PBL scheme have um, higher inversion length heights. Um, indicating uh, the uh, convective bundle layer um, build up too fast. At uh, uh, 7 p.m., the uh, simulated uh, PBL heights are very close to the observations, I mean, for all PBL schemes. Um, but uh, you can see here, um, the simulated the convective boundary, boundary layer um, are uh, slightly uh, unstable or neutral, but the observation is slightly stable. Next slide, please. So those are tendencies from the PBL schemes for PTQV wind speed at a different um, time respectively. And uh, uh, we can see uh, the all, almost all PBL schemes have um, very similar or close um, the uh, tendencies, but except the UW scheme. Uh, again, especially at the 7 p.m., the UW scheme has a very uh, strange tendencies. Uh, yeah, cannot explain uh, why. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a summary. Um, the Jefferson scheme and YSU schemes perform um, comparably over both regions, um, while the uh, MYN scheme performs uh, differently in many aspects, especially over the S uh, SEP. Um, compared uh, with observations, the UW scheme produces the best PPL height uh, over the um, SEP, and uh, the MYNN produces um, too high PPL height over the west part, western part of the SEP, while both bio, um, both the YSU and the Epsilon schemes uh, produce too low PPL and cloud top heights. Uh, the differences among the PPL heights uh, PBL schemes in simulating the um, PBL features of the uh, SGP are um, very, relatively small. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions yet. Um, okay, here's one in Slido. We've got time for one or two. Um, PBL height should be diagnosed by the same method for comparison. PT and QV profiles seem to be not so different among them. Um, are you using the uh, PBL heights that are produced by each scheme or are you re-diagnosing them? Here, uh, I showed the figure I showed um, over the um, Southeast Pacific um, are the PBL heights diagnosed by inside these two schemes. So they, the methods are different. So I just want to say, if you are use, directly use, use um, using the PBL heights from the model output, uh, probably there's a problem. Yeah, I think that's in general true that you can't compare them directly. Um, and another question, does the observed data come from radiosonde launches? Okay. 
okay, let me see. Obviously not the TKE, but. So, where is the question? Oh, um, well, they're in Slido, but um, the question was, does the observed data that you're showing come from radio sounds or from some other source? The observations from our radio sounds. Yeah, okay. And then George Bryan asks, does your scheme allow for counter gradient fluxes and how is that handled? Oh, uh, yes, it allows. Uh, it uses the uh, counter flux term, um, as I showed, is, which is um, very similar to the one you see in the YCU scheme. Yeah, okay. All right, well, I think we should probably go on to the next um, uh, presentation. Thank you, Chen Xi. Um, and the last uh, presentation for this session will be Patrick Hobbecker talking about simulations across scales in complex terrain. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me put this in presentation mode. And I should swap screens. Yeah? Yes. All right, how's it look? Looks good. Cool. All right, yeah, I'm Pat Hobbecker. I'm a uh, project scientist in RAL. Uh, and as was mentioned, the title is Simulations Cross Scales Over Complex Terrain, uh, heavy emphasis on lessons learned. Uh, and so I'd also like to acknowledge right off the bat my uh, co-authors on this paper that are listed here, or paper presentation. So quick background. This is the Pertigal field campaign. It's in Pertigal, Portugal. It was from December 2016, or yeah, 2016 to June 2017. And the main objective of this field campaign was to collect observations in order to improve model performance. So they were specifically targeting model performance um, as the outcome from this campaign, which is great, because more often than not, field campaigns are lacking in a lot of data that can be directly used to help uh, models. And so the impacts that they were considering first off was mostly wind energy, uh, but then there was also just uh, physics parameterizations and then flow and dispersion, especially in uh, complex terrain. So the instruments that they had, this is just a subset of them, the towers that um, are shown here in these white and blue circles. And on the right, this figure is the complex terrain, the two kind of uh, twin hills of the, the Pertigal site. Uh, they also had radio sons, uh, profilers, I believe they were LIDAR profilers. Um, and then they had several other instruments that I won't get into now. These are the ones just kind of I, I used for this uh, presentation. And so an overview of our team's modeling efforts. This isn't associated with the direct Pertigal, it's just our, our team at NCAR's uh, modeling efforts. The first thing, and I'm going to talk about here, is the wharf to wharf LES, uh, mesoscale to microscale inline simulations. And the overall goal is to do an intercomparison between that and uh, simulations with fast study, which if you're not familiar, is also a NCAR based model um, and say GPU based uh, model. So it's, as the name implies, very fast, um, but it is lacking in uh, a lot of physics parameterizations as of yet. It's very newly developed. So um, just for comparison on the top right is uh, a snapshot of the wharf LES output at DO5, which I'll go into in a second. And then on the bottom are two snapshots from uh, fast eddy output. Um, and so there's just kind of to a little eye candy, really. Um, so I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more. And lastly, the single column model um, using out, uh, yeah, the forcings from the wharf mesoscale and then thrown into a single column model. So the WARF setup, it's five domains. We have three mesoscale domains. And you can see in this table, uh, the top three, it's nine, three, and one kilometer grid spacing with um, 400 by 400 NX and Y, 60 vertical levels. And then we go down into LES. So as we shut off the PBL parameterization, which is MYNN 2.5. Um, and we turn on the one and a half order TKE turbulence closure. And domains four and five, we go to uh, directly from one kilometer to 100 meters, and then down to 20 meters. And we up our vertical grid spacing from 60 to 95 on DO4, and then from 95 to 188 on DO5. Um, for the uh, common physics parameterization uh, parameters in this uh, 
the revised Mononovikov, the unified NOAA land surface, and RRTMG short and long wave. And finally, the um, microphysics uh, WSM6. So these are all run on Cheyenne. And as mentioned in the previous plot uh, or in the previous slide, uh, pretty large domains. Um, so total of 165 million cells over the five domains. And we're running this for 12 hours of analysis and four hours of kind of staggered start times. Uh, so to allow for a spin up on the domain four and then allow for a spin up on domain five and keep chugging through for 12 hours. And so a uh, little information on these, it takes 12 hours to run all five domains. This is 12 hours wall time to run 30 minutes of simulation time. And Cheyenne's time limit is 12 hours. So it works out really well that basically every day I can get an hour of simulation if I stay up late enough. Um, and so in total, it's 24 restarts and then plus an additional four for model spin up. So it's roughly 500,000 core hours for just this one single simulation. This comes into play uh, when you keep in mind, if you get something wrong, the cost is expensive. So um, Worf has standard train data that comes uh, with the download. And the highest resolution available is this 30 second SRTM for terrain and for 20 meter, meter grid spacing, that's not going to be nearly fine enough. So we had to download auxiliary SST data seen in the top right is the uh, one second SRTM data and incorpor incorporated that into WPS. And then for land use, we also only had high, highest resolution available was 30 seconds. So we got the Corinne data set, um, which I forgot to write it down, but I believe is also close to five second data, it, it's higher, much higher resolution. I forget exactly what the, the Delta X is. Um, and there are some noticeable differences. And obviously for the terrain, we don't even have two twin peaks for the most part. It's just kind of a, a single hill. Um, and then once you get the high resolution data, your model can now start seeing, okay, there's a valley between these. And then for the land use data, obvious differences, but not an obvious right or wrong. Um, Corinne has been pretty extensively tested, so we kind of lean towards that being right, but um, it's harder to say. So and there was also some auxiliary physics that either aren't included yet in the public release of WARF, um, or they're just unknown or lesser known. First being the cell perturbation method um, which there's several uh, resources down here on the bottom if, if you want to look more into this. And then this figure at the top um, that shows if you, if you don't have uh, turbulence coming into your LES domains, it's going to take time and space fetch um, to generate this turbulence. So in this panel A, this non-perturbed flow, the first, let's say, third of the domain um, on the, the western side and then the bottom third on the southern side, are turbulent free. And then finally, turbulence starts picking up towards the end. However, if you perturb with um, these stochastics, temperature cell perturbations on your domains, you can almost recover an entire domain of, of turbulence. And this has been studied extensively and continues to be um, to this day uh, for different methods to do this. But we turn these on for both LES domains. And um, we've also found that it's very helpful in complex terrain. This is just a snapshot of what these stochastic turbulent cells look like over complex terrain. So to go through briefly with the mesoscale runs, um, most of these we, we looked uh, at comparing them to the SANS at first to see which reanalysis data set um, gave us the best results. So uh, the kind of flow to this was do some sensitivity on the mesoscale to find the best performer and then move to LES uh, to do a one and done simulation. And so this is just showing um, some results from the ERA-5, ERA interim, and the uh, GFS final analysis. And there's not much to say about this. I and mean, they all they all perform reasonably well. Um, and so we next tried to compare the mesoscale performance to uh, the towers. 
And so this is the 20 meter wind speed from all towers. You have the U component in the top, V component in the middle, and the total wind speed um, on the bottom. And the mesoscale results are shown if you have these black, the black line is the observation average. Red is era five. It's kind of buried below here. And I, I apologize. I did not think about the uh, colorblind schemes before making this plot. I do apologize. Um, blue is era interim and um, FNL, which is this first, uh, it's the, the green one down at the bottom. Uh, again, it's kind of hard to say which one performs better. And if you notice, there's these uh, kind of very low U wind speed and low V wind speed towers, which are the gray lines. And then there's these higher wind speed towers that seem to match better with the mesoscale results. So the observed mean doesn't match, but some of them seem to match. And so why is this? Um, when looking at domain three's depiction of the Pertigao Hills, which is on the left, there is no valley. Um, it's just one hill. And so if we dig a little deeper into this, uh, again, showing these plots, this is what the towers look like in basically reality, this is the DO, uh, DO5 domain. And this is what it looks like zoomed in on DO3. Where do we think that these gray lines that don't match up with our results are coming from? And if this is the predominant wind direction, you can kind of start thinking that there's probably a wake region in here. And sure enough, yes, when we uh, are on domain three, we don't resolve this wake. And so all these, uh, orangish color uh, dots are the low wind speed. But then when we look at, this is where the uh, wharf uh, comparison is being done. This is closest to this uh, cyan line of towers. And sure enough, when we look at the U and V in total wind speed, the mesoscale results actually do line up fairly well with all of these cyan, uh, the, the Eastern Ridge, I'm sorry, Western Ridge uh, results. Now, I would like to show the tower comparison on the LES domain for um, each of these points on the LES. However, we don't have that. Um, so what I'm showing here is just a domain average over this windowed time region here. So between 12 and 18 Z, this top plot is the average wind speed there, where we can start to see that on the ridge, or on each of the ridges, we have higher wind speeds and in the valley and uh, the wake region of the, both the, the hills, we have lower wind speed. So I couldn't reproduce this exact figure for the LES, um, but we're starting to see that we can capture based on this, this higher resolution terrain, the, the physically driven flow um, of the, the wake region. So I apologize, this is something that we can hopefully get and this is where the lessons learned start really uh, piling up. So, we had an issue with the mesoscale to microscale simulation. Um, and this is turns out to be a fairly well known issue. So top left is the domain three and we're looking at the vertical uh, wind speed component. And it's kind of difficult to see. So I zoom in here, we have these streaky structures um, showing up on this, the one kilometer mesoscale domain. And I have outlined here domain four's uh, footprint. So if we go to the top right, where the background is still domain three, but then I have domain four's vertical component wind speed, these streaky structures that are inflowing into this uh, eastern boundary are highly emphasized and persist throughout all of DO4. And then when we look at DO5's footprint, so this is the 20 meter domain, these streaks remain within the simulation. And so these streaks have been found to be non-physical. It's from issues uh, with the terra incognita, the uh, gray zone of PBL parameterizations, which has been mentioned in previous talks. Um, it's discussed in this paper, as well as um, a, another paper here listed at the bottom, again, for reference, if anyone wants to look more into this, but there are ways to mitigate these roles. And so we've started doing a lot of mesoscale sensitivity um, using different PBL schemes, and also um, increasing Smagorinsky coefficient to try to reduce the impact of these roles. That way, once they're gone, we can feed them into the LES um, without any noticeable impact from these roles. So uh, to wrap this up, the, the main thing here is lessons learned. So 
Um, one of the, the first things to keep in mind when you're going from mesoscale to microscale is the, in WARF in particular, um, the size of the mesoscale domains needs to be sufficiently large to allow for proper scaling of the LES domain. So if you only had a mesoscale domain of 150 by 150 NX and NY, but wanted to run a 500 by 500 LES um, at some point in your simulation, the amount of uh, computational power you can throw at it will be limited by your smallest size domain. And so in this, we had to make our mesoscale domains pretty large so that when we get to our 800 by 800 LES, we can throw a lot of, uh, of CPUs at it. Um, so the, the next thing is to develop your grid spacing based on your target LES grid spacing and then work your way up. Um, originally, we had started from kind of a uh, 2793 and then just started working our way down. It got really complex with our grid ratios to try to hit exactly what we wanted. And so instead, we worked from what we wanted and started multiplying by ratios um, to get uh, something that worked. Because on the mesoscale, if you had uh, one kilometer and 1.125 kilometers, maybe it's not a big difference. Um, but if you needed 25 meter in the LES, one of those is going to be better than the other. Um, and the mes mesoscale roll issues, as was just mentioned, there are ways to do that by increasing your CS to dissipate the structures um, or also using different PBL schemes. YSU uh, generally performed a lot better uh, in terms of not producing these roll-like features, whereas the MYNN 2.5 uh, produced them pretty drastically. And so the big thing here, get it right the first time, which is not going to happen. Um, but we, we went pretty far into the LES simulations before realizing, oh, wow, these rolls are really starting to uh, impact performance and had to cut it off, recalibrate, and are just now starting to rerun the LES simulations again. So analyzing your mesoscale domain um, before going into the LES is, is going to be um, very important. And then one of the things that we've been using and, and uh, if anyone also wants to, to start doing this sort of workflow as well as fast study, as mentioned before, is a very fast and efficient model. Um, doesn't have all the same physics, so it's not going to give us the same results, but we've been kind of using that as our guinea pig, um, feeding that the mesoscale forcing and seeing how it does with uh, the role development and all those sort of things. And we found one setup that worked well with fast study, and now we're going to move forward with using that for wharf. So just to put them all on one slide, I have uh, the references that were uh, mentioned in this study. Um, and then I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Pat Patrick, thank you. And thank you for leaving uh, some time for questions. Um, there are a couple of questions in Slido. Uh, one of them is about details of the uh, cell perturbation method. And I think the sensible thing to do there is to uh, read the paper. Um, uh, another person asks, do you think that the cell perturbation method may have some effect on the simulated wind speeds? Yeah, so it does. Um, but what, what's typically been found uh, for the cell perturbation method is it brings the wind speeds closer to what are observed in a quicker time. And so uh, these cell perturbations essentially are temperature perturbations um, that are sufficiently large so they're not damped out by um, numerical dissipation. And all it is doing is kind of agitating the flow to start spinning up turbulent features quicker. And there's different ways to do it. Here we use stochastic uh, temperature perturbations. And uh, essentially, it will impact the flow. But what a lot of times it does is it increases uh, your, your surface drag and, and the shear throughout the lower levels. Whereas when you're in a non-turbulent flow, you don't quite get that same mixing. So it does in, in influence the wind speeds, but in a positive way. Good, thank you. Um, are there other questions? Um, I don't see any hand raised. Oh, um, question is which Corinne version was used because of the burning that happened in late 2017? Oh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I can look into it. Um, I, I don't have the Slido up right now, um, but if you're interested, I, I can follow up with that. Okay, good. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that you ran into this problem with um, erroneous roles. And um, 
there's been some literature on that. Um, one of them was mine uh, recently, and I put the uh, DOI for that in the Slido as well. Um, that's a, a known but uh, non-trivial problem. Um, let's see, there's one more thing here. Oh uh, yeah, horizontal convective rolls. No, they are not real features. Um, they look real, but they're not. Um, so you can say more about that, Patrick, if you want to. Yeah, and I think that was the kind of, um, we, we know of the horizontal convective rolls in terms of physical features because they do exist in nature. Um, but the size, the scale of these is not physical and they are uh, grid dependent. And so it's pretty easy to, to suss out that no, these are not physical. They do exist in nature, but not like this. Right. Okay, well, I think we will go on to the break then. And thank you to all the speakers in this session. And um, you will be back, I believe, at uh, 10.50. Uh, with a different chair. So thanks to everybody. Great job, Wayne, to keep them on time. <laughs> Thank you.
Ludin, are you here? Yes. Okay. Can you see me and hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Yeah. I have my full screen. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I turn on my, then, turn on my video. Yeah. I'm waiting for Hugh, and he should be here any moment. I'm on. Oh, cool. Oh. <laughs> I'll stop sharing and see if you can bring up your slides. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try and pull these up. And. Uh, Good. Yeah, yeah looks like that. Yeah. Full screen. Okay, I think okay. it works. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> we got we ran into a little bit of scare yesterday. But they're all good. Okay. Um let's just wait for a couple minutes. Yeah. Yeah, we're I think it's two minutes early still. I think I've seen Jason earlier and uh is Robert here? Robert Conrick? Uh, yes, I am here. Okay, all right. So you got all your speakers. Um, okay, uh, I think Jason is somewhere. Hi, sorry about the dog barking ways, Jason. I just sent okay. you uh, an email from a, an updated version of my presentation just in case, but I think it'll be okay. Okay, okay. I will download that. Uh, I think, Ludin, you know that the first one is a little bit longer. Yes, right? oh, 30 minutes. Yep. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Right. Hopefully, I can jam all the same in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I'll say, you sent I'll... me 60 slides yesterday. Here. <laughs> this is a five minute reminder. Are, yeah. are you going to? Uh, Yeah, I think it's 10.50. Wait, do you want me to start or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just get started, I think, right. yeah. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome back to our last session of the workshop. And the theme is about microphysics. And I think I'll uh, uh, give a five minute remind to each speaker. And then uh, just a remind to all the other participants, it will be, much easier for the speaker to address your question if you leave your name uh, after your questions on Slido. So uh, our first speaker is Hugh Morrison from NCAR. Uh, he will give an overview on the microphysics. So uh, the virtual floor is yours, Hugh. Okay, thanks, Lu Lin. Um, so yeah, I don't think uh, I need to give too much of an introduction, um, but the title is Basics of Microphysics and Weather and Climate Models. So this is gonna be a pretty high level talk. Um, just covering really some of the, the basic aspects of uh, microphysics parameterizations and, and models, um, obviously here with an eye toward, uh, toward wharf and impasse. Um, so hopefully everything will work okay here. Last minute, I had to switch to my wife's computer. Um, so my name is, is not actually Milena. I did not change my name. Um, that's what's coming up on Zoom. Um, so hopefully this will all work okay. Um, I'll jump ahead and um, give a few slides on an introduction, just sort of defining what microphysics is and some of the very basics. And then I'll have a few slides on some uh, specifics of microphysics schemes and the different types and so forth. And then I'll end with a few slides on um, practical aspects of choosing microphysics schemes, particularly with regard to WARF. So as a very basic slide here, 
Um, what, you know, we, we want to define exactly what we mean by microphysics. So this is the collection of microscale physical processes involving formation, evolution of cloud and precipitation particles. So things like condensation, evaporation, freezing and melting, so forth. So the diagram here is just an illustration of some of the microphysical processes in an idealized uh, thunderstorm cloud. And I'm not gonna step through and explain this in, a lot, in all kinds of detail because the main point here is just to illustrate that it's very complicated. Um, you know, you have cloud condensation nuclei that can be ingested into cloud base. They can form cloud droplets. They can then grow by condensation and later by collision coalescence. They can form ice particles. Uh, above the freezing level of all different uh, types. And, and, uh, and then those ice particles can further grow and fall and melt and form raindrops and so forth. So really the, the, the key challenge in models is how to represent this um, complexity in a tractable way. So we can break this challenge into really two distinct um, challenges. The first is, the inability to represent individual cloud particles explicitly. Um, and this is true even with, with, with uh, massive advances in computing. For example, even a small cloud, say a kilometer cubed, could easily have 10 to the power of 17 individual droplets, which obviously we can't track each one of those droplets in any kind of reasonable way. So to a large extent, microphysics parameterization boils down to how to represent the cloud particle population statistically from uh, our uh, model variables that are predicted within, uh, within the uh, model grid volume. Um, but there's a separate challenge here that even at the scale of individual particles, there's still a lot of fundamental uncertainty in the basic physics of the microphysical processes that, that operate on those particles. Um, this is especially true for the ice phase. For example, there are still large uncertainties with regard to vapor diffusional growth of ice, uh, how it collects water through, uh, via rhyming and aggregational growth. Um, there's still uncertainties in liquid phase microphysics as well, particularly for, uh, for drop breakup. So the main point here is that even if we could explicitly model every cloud particle, there would still be critical process level uncertainty. So just to summarize, microphysics is really dominated by, by uncertainties. There's another aspect to this, and that is the challenge of uh, representing microphysics across models of different scales. Um, as we all know, clouds are fundamentally a multi-scale uh, phenomenon. And um, the range of scales is really huge. You know, everything from, I'm not sure if people can see my cursor here, but um, everything from the scale of uh, microns or even submicrons for individual particles, out to the scale of individual clouds and cloud systems, say, you know, from hundreds of meters out to, you know, tens or even hundreds of kilometers out to large scale, you know, planetary scale uh, waves. So different models can represent, um, obviously the, uh, or can resolve different aspects of this in terms of resolving the clouds or, uh, or cloud scale motions. Um, in varying degrees, depending on the particular model type. So down here at this, at the left end of this, um, at the highest resolution, you have direct numerical simulation that resolves all scales of turbulence. And that actually can represent individual particles and how they interact with that turbulent flow. But um, because of the computational expense of this, these are really limited to about a meter cubed domain. But these are useful for understanding um, uh, how cloud particles um, behave in a turbulent flow, and then that can be scaled up to develop parameterizations. And there's, there's ongoing work doing that. As we move to the right here with large eddy simulation, with uh, can represent scales in the order of, of meters or tens of meters. Um, then uh, we can't represent individual cloud particles. Like I said, just the sheer number is, is impossible to capture. So we have parameterized microphysics in resolved clouds or the, the, the important scales of, uh, of clouds and the cloud scale motions. As we move further to the right here, say convection permitting models, like models that would have uh, you know, grid spacing on the order of a, of a kilometer or so, where uh, the convection can be permitted, but it's not explicitly resolved. We have parameterized microphysics and under-resolved clouds. And then going to even larger scale models, where very little of the cloud scale motion is, re is, is actually resolved. We have parameterized microphysics and parameterized clouds 
which has been called the parameterization squared problem, which kind of encapsulates that challenge. So um, one thing I want to get across here is that one of the big challenges as you move towards these larger scale models is actually how to represent that subgrid scale cloud variability. And, um, and that really kind of encapsulates a few different aspects. One is the cloud fraction and then the distribution of subgrid scale cloud water. And that has been referred to as, as macro physics as opposed to micro physics. It can be a little bit hard to distinguish those by ear. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about the macro physics part of the problem, but that is an important thing I wanna, I wanna mention here, really in, in models of all scales from, from LES up, but particularly in, in larger scale models um, and the way that that's coupled with the, with the cloud microphysics. So from here on, I'm really gonna focus on the, the parameterized microphysics aspect of this. And I'm gonna talk about um, some of the, the basic ways that that's represented in models. Um, so there are very broadly speaking, three main types of microphysics schemes. Um, bulk schemes that predict one or a few bulk quantities for each cloud and precipitation category. So this is usually things like cloud mass mixing ratio or cloud number in, in multi-moment schemes. And then the particle distribution is typically but not always assumed to follow some analytic functional form. In bin schemes, the population is discretized into different size or more often mass bins, and then one or two quantities are predicted in each bin. So with bin schemes, there are obviously a lot more degrees of freedom to represent evolution of particle size distributions compared to bulk schemes, but that comes with a cost because you have to uh, move all those those variables around and then to calculate the process rates, you have to numerically integrate over the, the distribution. So Lagrangian particle-based schemes uh, represent uh, microphysics in quite a different way from the Eulerian bulk and bin schemes. Um, in Lagrangian schemes, they represent cloud and precipitation particles with representative uh, so-called super particles that each represent some a multitude of actual cloud and precipitation particles. And that number that they represent is referred to as the multiplicity factor. And then each of these super particles are carried within the model flow based on Lagrangian trajectories. So because bulk schemes are computationally cheap and simple, they really remain the workhorses of weather and climate models. And that's, that's gonna remain so um, in well into the future. Um, as I'll talk about, bin schemes are much more computationally expensive as well as Lagrangian schemes. Um, compared with the earliest developments of bulk schemes, which really took place in the, in the 1960s and even going back to the 50s with the, the pioneering work of uh, Edwin Kessler, um, there have been many developments over the past decades. And these have primarily centered around two, two aspects. One is the inclusion of ice microphysics um, to varying degrees of detail. And then the prediction of additional bulk moments besides just the, the mass mixing ratio. For example, two moment schemes that predict both mass and number. So um, you can illustrate, you can, you can see here the addition of all this complexity. So the original sort of bulk approach um, developed by Kessler, a box diagram of that is shown in the lower left here, where he had this idea of separating condensed water into a cloud mode and a rain mode. Um, in addition to predicting water vapor. And then there are a few processes that represent conversions between these different categories. So between vapor and cloud liquid, there's condensation evaporation. Cloud liquid can then be converted to rain through two, uh, this is parameterized in two distinct ways, um, auto conversion and accretion. So auto conversion represents the, uh, the growth of cloud drops through collision coalescence um, to form embryo raindrops and accretion represents the growth of existing raindrops by collecting cloud water. And then rain, of course, can fall and, and evaporate. So compared with Kessler's original scheme, which was developed in the late 60s, you can see all this additional complexity, um, inclusion of ice microphysics, which in the past has typically been done by adding different ice categories representing different types of ice. Um, and then all these arrows represent different processes that move water um, between uh, these different categories. So as I mentioned in bulk schemes, usually some functional form is assumed for the, to represent the particle size distributions. Um, different functional forms have been used, but the most common one is a three parameter gamma function. So this has these three so-called free parameters, um, n naught, 
the intercept parameter, mu, the shape parameter, and lambda, the slope parameter. And D here represents particle size or particle diameter. So predicted bulk quantities like Q, so Q here is gonna to refer to the mass on mixing ratio that's predicted in the model in a bulk scheme, are, are either equal to or proportional to integrals of the size distribution. So formally, those are moments of the size distribution. So for example, uh, the mass mixing ratio is proportional to the third moment of the distribution, at least for liquid uh, drops. And for the, for the number, uh, it's equal to the zeroth moment of the distribution. And there are many other moments that correspond with, uh, with physical quantities. So one of the nice things about gamma function and, and why they're used so widely in, in bulk schemes is that the integrals are easy to calculate. They're basically analytic. So we can invert these analytic integrals to then solve for the size distribution parameters, um, lambda, mu, uh, and or n naught from the predicted uh, variables in the model. So the typical approach in a one moment bulk scheme is to specify mu and n naught and then evolve lambda from the predicted Q um, and the specified mu and n naught. In two moment schemes, um, the typical approach, or actually I think all existing two moment schemes do this, you specify mu and then evolve lambda and n naught from the predicted Q and n, the, the number, and then the specified mu. And then in three moment schemes, um, which are now uh, you know, coming, coming more into use, there's a few now in war, at least partial three moment schemes. So these uh, have three predicted variables and, and therefore they can evolve uh, lambda and not and mu um, kind of independently. There's a one-to-one -one mapping um, between the three predicted variables and the, um, and the three parameters. Um, so bin scheme development took quite a different track, although it did uh, originate around the same time as the development of bulk schemes, so back in the 1950s and, and 60s. But they took a much different approach from the very simplified approach for, for uh, bulk scheme development. The idea was to basically um, capture in, in you know, the most realistic way possible the evolution of, of drop size distributions. Um, so, you know, based on, on basically current state of the art physics rather than, than trying to use uh, or represent that in a simplified way. So, the growth shrinkage of drops with size or mass of uh, of a given uh, size are calculated from theory or observations. For example, um, diffusional growth of cloud droplets, which can be written in, uh, in this form right here. So then bin schemes have to come up with a way based on this diffusional growth to move mass or number across bins like this, or in the case of evaporation shrinkage where they would move in the opposite way. So we need to come up with numerical methods for how this is done. Um, and you can think of this as being analogous to sort of a one-dimensional advection problem. So you're basically moving stuff across, uh, across grids. Um, and this has really been a key challenge of bin schemes since their inception in the, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, much better numerical methods have been developed since the 1980s. Um, and in particular, I would say now there are two main methods for, for doing this um, in, in bin schemes. One is a uh, two moment approach, we actually predict mass and number in each bin, and that allows uh, uh, constraint and, and better uh, growth processes, or um, a, a, an approach where um, during the processes, multiple moments of the distribution are basically conserved. Um, and that's, you know, a, a different track, but, but predicting just one moment in each, so, so just number or mass within each bin. Um, and the latter approach is what's actually used um, within the uh, spectral bin microphysics scheme or Tel Aviv, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the spectral bin microphysics scheme of Hebrew University uh, in the WARF model in the bin scheme that's, that's uh, been implemented in there. So one key thing though I wanna emphasize is the spectral broadening from numerical diffusion still remains a problem. And this is particularly from vertical advection, not so much the growth across bins per se, but then when you couple that with the fact that the bin variables have to move around in an Eulerian spatial grid, and that can lead to uh, the spectral broadening. Um, so Lagrangian particle-based microphysics, like I said, is quite different in how it uh, represents microphysics because it basically 
follows uh, Lagrangian trajectories of super particles within the model to flow. And one of the key things is that because of that, there is no spurious numerical diffusion. And for uh, an article that discusses this in more detail and compares and contrasts the, the, uh, the Lagrangian particle-based approach versus the bin approach, I point people to, uh, to this um, review article by Grabowski et al. that was recently published in BAMS. Um, so one thing I want to talk about, but I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this because I'm gonna uh, I think that Jason is gonna cover this in a lot more detail. But I do want to mention how ice microphysics is particularly challenging because of the wide variety of, of particle shapes. We all know that you know ice particles take on a, a wide variety of different shapes and types. And the way that that is typically done in bulk, um, bulk schemes is to represent um, ice with a set of categories that correspond to certain types of ice with fixed properties. So for example, a typical uh, set of categories would be cloud ice, snow, grapple, and hail. So there's a few kind of conceptual problems with this. Real ice particles have complex shapes. So you know, shoehorning these into a few categories with fixed properties is obviously a huge simplification of nature. Um, conversion between categories is often ad hoc or, or not physically well constrained. And then conversion leads to large discrete changes in particle properties. Um, for example, moving from snow to grapple can result in a large increase in the density, as you see here, from something you know typically say 100 kilograms per meter cubed up to 400 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, I'll mention that bin microphysics schemes have a similar problem, for example, between conversion of, of snow to grapple. Um, and there has been a recent shift um, from these discrete categories to, uh, to the prediction of particle properties. So you smoothly evolve these properties rather than assigning things to different ice types. And I'm gonna, that's all I'm gonna say about this because I, I believe Jason's gonna cover this in much more detail in his talk. So there's a handful of papers and studies that have, uh, have moved towards this kind of approach um, for, for bulk schemes. And I will mention that this is particularly well suited for Lagrangian schemes um, because these different particle properties can be added as additional attributes that are basically carried along with the super particles. And it's a very, I would say, computationally uh, efficient and, and well-suited um, approach for, for doing that. And there's a recent paper here by Shinichiro Shima et al. that talks about uh, this kind of approach in a, uh, in a Lagrangian scheme. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here talking about a few practical aspects. Um, one thing I want to emphasize here is the simulations are often very sensitive to how or to the representation of microphysics, both to using different microphysics schemes as well as different parameter settings within a single scheme. This is illustrated by some recent papers that have come out using the WARF model to simulate a quasi-idealized squalline case, one kilometer horizontal grid spacing here. This shows horizontal cross sections of reflectivity at one kilometer height. Um, and I said, this is quasi-idealized. So the model framework is simple, but it's still observationally based. So in the upper left here, this shows results for the observations. And then in the lower left here are three different bin schemes that were used in the WARF model. In the middle here are four different bulk schemes. And then to assess the robustness of the res results, this bulk scheme here was run with different uh, random number of seeds applied for, uh, for random perturbations to the, to the temperature field just to evaluate the, the impact of different realizations. You can see here that the impact of different realizations is much smaller than differences among these schemes. Um, so one of the key points here is that the results are quite sensitive here. And perhaps one surprising thing is that the differences among the bin schemes are also quite large. For example, if you look at just the reflectivity structure as well as the propagation speed, which you can see here by the location of the leading edge of the, of the line here, it's quite different arguably is large or even larger than differences among these four bulk schemes. So in WARF, there are many different options for, for microphysics schemes. This, I just pulled this from the, the README name list, um, which has all the different options here. Um, you can break this down into the different categories I talked about. There are several one moment schemes, including the Kessler scheme, which is, is still in WARF. Um, and then you know a handful of different two moment schemes. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the Hebrew University model um, or spectral bin microphysics scheme um, that is implemented, a few different versions of that implemented at WARF. 
And then I also mentioned how there are a few different three moment schemes now, at least for three moment for the ice categories um, that have been uh, very recently implemented. Um, what I mean here by partial two moment or three moment is that it's represented with uh, two or three moments for at least one category, but not necessarily all categories. I'll, I'll point out that there's not a Lagrangian microphysics scheme implemented in WARF yet, at least in the publicly available version. Um, that's something that, that we would hope to do in the um, not too distant future. I think that would be a really nice feature of WARF uh, for, for research applications. Um, a few other comments here. I think most people would agree some schemes are better than others generally, but no scheme is better for everything. You know, if you go to say WARF workshops, WARF and past workshops in the past, you see different intercomparison studies, evaluating different microphysics schemes. And in general, you know, different schemes, just they, they will do better for some cases than others. Um, so how to decide which to use? Well, there's a few practical considerations I wanna point out. Um, of course, one important thing to consider is just the type of application, whether you're doing research, uh, numeric weather prediction, climate modeling, and so forth. Um, a big factor is the computational cost, which I'll say more about on the next slide. Um, and then the model resolution is, is important and the cloud regime or case. Obviously, if you're modeling a case with ice, you, you, know, you would wanna use a, a microphysics scheme that can represent ice. So some general guidelines, um, depending on application computational cost is often a limiting factor. In general, microphysics is expensive. It can easily be 50% or more of the total cost in runtime. I mentioned bin schemes being slower. Um, very roughly speaking, they can often be about one to two orders of magnitude slower than, than bulk schemes. Um, Multi-moment schemes are more, multi-moment bulk schemes are more expensive than one moment bulk schemes. And the cost differences among these schemes largely reflects the number of predicted variables. In WARF, depending on the particular eviction option, each extra predicted variable adds a few percent in runtime, just, just from the cost of eviction. Although there are some methods that have been proposed that can reduce the cost of eviction for multi-moment bulk schemes and bin schemes that I would say could be considered um, for, for WARF and MPAS in the future to help reduce that cost. Um, for research, we typically want schemes with a reasonable level of, of process detail. I would say nowadays, you know, that would be considered, say, a two-moment scheme. Um, but, of course, still keeping in mind cost. Roughly speaking, two-moment schemes can be anywhere from about 10 to 30% more than, than one-moment schemes. Um, and the scheme type and complexity should be commensurate with cloud regime and model resolution. So a few points on this. Obviously, clouds with ice, like I said, require a scheme that can represent ice. Um, deep convection generally requires a scheme that can represent dense rhymed ice. So this would be a drop or hail category or one of the newer um, property-based schemes that can, that can evolve uh, rhymed ice and represent how that changes density and fall speed. And then, um, and then Lagrangian schemes should really only be used in models with high enough resolution to explicitly represent cloud and convective scale dynamics since they explicitly calculate you know, the activation process and how, uh, and, and particle uh, growth via, drop growth via, via condensation. So uh, just a few slides left. I wanted to have a, a broad slide here on just future directions. This is sort of my own, I guess, personal view on, on where things are going. Other people may, may have other thoughts here. Um, so while increasing computer power, power will mean greater use of bin, especially Grangian schemes, bulk schemes will, be a mainstay of weather and climate models in the foreseeable future, primarily just from the, from the cost difference. Um, you know, the, the, the jump from bulk to bin schemes in terms of cost is, is very large, like I said. Um, there's been this move away from discrete ice categories towards prediction of particle properties, and Jason is going to talk more about that. Um, greater use of Lagrangian schemes, which provides an exciting avenue for research. Um, so really, these schemes are fairly new in terms of uh, being more widespread in more widespread usage. Um, and that's really going to continue within the next decade. Um, and, uh, and then incorporation of rigorous statistical tools to understand scheme behavior and better constrain with observations and detailed process models. This could include components of machine learning. Um, I didn't talk about that at all, and I'm not going to talk about it further, but if people are interested, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it later. So this is my last slide with some take home points. Um, the parameterization of microphysics is an important component. I could probably even say a critical component 
of atmospheric models. But as I said, it's really dominated by uncertainty in many ways. Um, different types of schemes have different ways of representing particle size distributions. I highlighted the three main types, bulk band and Grangian particle based. Um, bulk schemes really remain the workhorses for operational weather and climate modeling, as well as a, a, you know, majority of research still uses bulk schemes. Um, though many advances have been made in bulk schemes over the past several decades and will continue to, to be made in the future. And then the practical choice of what scheme to use depends on uh, the particular application, the computational cost, cloud type being simulated and the model resolution. And uh, with that, I will take questions. Great, thank you for the nice uh, overview, uh, Hugh. And we we have time for several questions. Uh, so far, I, I saw one from Slido. I will uh, I'll just uh, speak it out and, and please provide your answer, Hugh. The question is, please give references about microphysics process. Does it involve application of fluid mechanics such as Navier-Stokes uh, Navi equation, et cetera? Um, well, it, I would say, you know, for bulk parameterizations um, in large scale models, that's generally not done. But I mentioned before how uh, high resolution models like, uh, like DNS with, can represent individual particles do explicitly model how particles evolve in, uh, in the turbulent flow. So they're, you know, they're explicitly solving Navier-Stokes with particles um, and represent particle-particle interactions and, and so forth. So I would say that's not done you know, directly simply because it can't be resolved in, in other models, but those results using DNS can be used to develop parameterizations to scale up in, in larger scale models. So there is kind of a, a chain and connection between um, you know, all these models across different scales. I'm not sure if that gets at your question or not. Uh, I can't actually read these questions, so I'm I'm just going off of what what you're saying, Lulin. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we have a yeah we have another question pop out uh, on Slido. So, uh, do you think there is a there is sensitivity of a microphysics scheme to vertical model resolution? Um. In general, I think there can be. Uh, and there have been a few studies that have looked at sensitivity to that. Um, in particular, with climate modeling, um, there have been a number of studies basically showing how auto conversion and accretion can be quite sensitive to, you know, how many layers are contained, uh, or how many model layers are within the cloud for, say, you know, strata cumulus. Um, in general, though, there's been a lot more work on looking at sensitivity to, to horizontal resolution. But you know, certainly I think that we need to look at impacts of, of vertical resolution. Um, so yeah, I welcome studies that, that look into that. I don't have a more specific answer than that. It's a pretty, pretty broad question, so. Yeah, there's another question, but I think that one is a little bit hard to answer uh, in this format. So you're, can you please go uh, offline and, and check this the very last? Okay, uh, I don't question. know where I can see these. Oh, the Slido? Okay, I think uh, Wei, uh, Wei post that the link through the chat. So if you click on chat, you can- I did, yeah, I clicked on chat, but nothing is coming up. Oops, okay, sorry for that, uh, but we have to move <laughs> on. And thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, we'll, uh, continue our session with our second speaker, uh, Robert Conrick from University of, of Washington. And the title is, Does World Have a Warm Ram Problem? Uh, so here we go, Robert. All righty, thank you very much. And uh, I thank uh, Hugh Morrison for that uh, great microphysics introduction, saves me a lot of work here. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, you know, this, this question right here, which is, does WARF have a warm rain problem? And, uh, you know, usually when uh, presentations start with a question, um, you know, you can usually expect the answer to be uh, yes. And so hopefully I'll convince you of that um, today. But before we get into that, I want to pose a little bit more of a, a philosophical question, which uh, piggybacks off of what, uh, what Hugh Morrison was talking about. And so, you know, our microphysical schemes have increased tremendously in complexity. Uh, but I'm just going to leave this question here, which is sort of, you know, have these changes resulted in any appreciable improvements to warm rain? 
And so what I'm talking about is that after many field campaigns that we've had, so one that pops into mind is the Improve campaign of 2001, which uh, I know several people on this call have been uh, involved in or, or worked with that data. Um, you know, after that campaign and, and ones like it, we had quality measurements of ice phase hydrometeors uh, and their interactions really for the first time. And so there was this push to use data aloft to try to improve precipitation forecasts near the surface. And now with a campaign like Improve, you know, this was on the West Coast where we have uh, moist marine air at the surface that's impacting uh, a mountainous area. And this actually results in quite a bit of warm rain that forms uh, near the surface in conjunction with all of that uh, cold rain. Uh, that's that's uh, forming from ice aloft. Now, focusing on all of these ice processes uh, has certainly been instrumental uh, in improving our understanding of, of moist physics. Uh, it's resulted in you know a number of uh, new parameterizations and improvements to parameterizations. So you know, pick your favorite here on the left. Um, but you know, now we have quality uh, low level microphysical data. And, and the field campaign that comes to mind and the data I've been working with pretty extensively is the uh, Olympex campaign in, in 2015 and 2016. And so we've, you know, acquired a lot of uh, liquid phase microphysical data, uh, but it still seems that uh, kind of as a model development community, we're looking aloft still. We're still looking at ice phase physics to try to improve our forecast near the surface. And so the question that comes out of all of that is, have we been ignoring warm rain throughout all of these development cycles? And so as far back as, as really the, the late 90s, when we were using uh, MM5 as our, as our favorite model, uh, warm rain problems were apparent then. And you know, a couple of references here to that that I, I won't get into details on. Um, but uh, you know, a few years later, uh, in 2008, there was a study by Minder et al. that basically uh, reiterated some of that, that uh, precipitation is generally underpredicted uh, along coastal areas of the Pacific Northwest, particularly during warm storms like, like atmospheric rivers or other events where there's a lot of uh, warm rain uh, going on. And so uh, there have been a number of more recent studies uh, that have found similar problems with dwarf microphysics, so moving away from MM5. Um, and so I've listed a few of them here, but kind of the, the key themes is that all of these studies have indicated under prediction of precipitation, uh, and most of these studies involve coastal areas or warmer uh, kind of atmospheric river type uh, events. And one thing to mention here, uh, that I'll, I'll get into here in just a second also, is that all of these studies handle uh, multiple wharf versions. Um, a few of them compare different microphysics schemes. So despite all of these, these differences in the modeling systems, uh, really the story is very similar in this kind of warm rain environment that we're under predicting precipitation. And so, more recent evaluations uh, that I've been a part of uh, and, that other, and that others have been a part of have shown that even modern microphysics schemes in WARF continue to underpredict precipitation. And so this is true for versions uh, 371, 381, still true with, with 4.1.3, and I, I suspect it's, it's probably true as well with uh, even the, the most recent version. And so here on the left, I'm showing some uh, figures from a, a paper that we published a couple years ago of uh, precipitation accumulations uh, in Washington state uh, over a few stations that are, are pretty close to the coast and experience warm rain. And the black dashed line here are observations. And all of these colored lines indicate different microphysical schemes. And so, you know, pick your favorite scheme. It was still under predicting precipitation during these warm rain events. Now, here on the right is another study published in 2020 and uh, used a similar event and found very similar results. That when you look at windward slopes of mountains, and they also looked at coastal areas, that uh, we have under predicted precipitation by current bulk microphysics schemes. 
So one other uh, study we did to, to investigate this was to look at raindrop size distributions uh, in the wharf model and compare those with observations. And so we looked at a couple of events uh, where there was fairly abundant warm rain. And what we found is that here on the left, uh, we have an error of uh, the intercept parameter of the distribution, of the drop size distribution, which is directly proportional to uh, the number concentration. We found that that was underpredicted, so we have too few drops in the model. And then here on the right, this is the uh, size of your raindrops, and we found that those are overpredicted in the model. And so, you know, having drops that are too large and too few uh, is much more characteristic of cold rain. And more importantly, uh, there's no scheme dependence here. So uh, once again, just like with precipitation, we found that uh, it doesn't matter which microphysics scheme you chose, uh, these biases were still present. So this all sort of begs the question of whether or not there's a common model deficiency here. And so, you know, the underprediction of precipitation and poor drop size distribution representation, as we just saw, is uh, agnostic of which scheme you choose. And so uh, I just wanted to, to sort of uh, lay out a little bit of, uh, you know, a few thoughts here. So, you know, uh, as, as Hugh Morrison was just talking about, uh, there's a lot of different uh, process rates uh, and formulations for, for processes. Uh, some schemes contain completely different processes than others. And finally, uh, you know, there's, there's different conversion thresholds for, for hydrometeors, different uh, densities of hydrometeors and things like that. And so all of these differences among schemes, because schemes tend to be so different, uh, sort of implies that it's unlikely that any of these things are uh, potentially to blame for this sort of common bias that we're noting. And so, for uh, the rest of the talk and, and sort of for, for this project, uh, we kind of went back to the basics and we focused on drop size distributions. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a fact that uh, nearly all bulk schemes use uh, essentially the same size distributions for rain and cloud water. So that's exponential for rain and, and gamma for cloud. Uh, you know, of course, there's some, some deviations in there. Um, and there have been a lot of studies that have shown that exponential distributions are indeed fairly accurate uh, representations of rainwater distributions, not to mention the, the uh, computational ease of that. Um, but unfortunately, cloud water distributions are not easily nor commonly measured, especially near the surface and uh, more especially uh, during precipitation, especially warm rain. And unfortunately, there haven't been uh, any observations really of cloud water distributions near the surface uh, during uh, either of the two big uh, field campaigns that we had out on the West Coast uh, that observed microphysics. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on cloud water. And rather than running a whole field campaign to get some observations, we're going to use a spectral bin microphysics model and see what the cloud water distributions look like during warm rain events. And so for this, uh, I'm using a version uh, 4.2.2 of, uh, of WARF with uh, a special uh, warm rain only version of the bin scheme that's currently available in WARF. Um, it's over a, a single four kilometer domain right here. So kind of centered over the, the Pacific Northwest where we get all this nice warm rain. And I'm also uh, going to be showing results from a uh, control run uh, that uses uh, a slightly different version of WARF and the uh, Thompson uh, Eidhammer microphysics. Now, it's important to mention that uh, the results I'll be showing are going to be from uh, warm only versions of these schemes, so no ice physics are going to be present. So there's a pretty interesting case study from Olympex that we'll be using uh, for this. And it's uh, 15th of February, 2016, which is at the tail end of the project. Uh, but uh, we still had a few observing assets that, uh, that stuck around during this time. And so what I'm showing here on the left are drop size distributions uh, from this location on this map over here on the right side. And you know we have our diameter bins and time across the horizontal here. And so before about 10 UTC on this day, this dashed line here, we had precipitation that was more characteristic of warm, uh, sorry, of cold rain 
So we had larger uh, drops present. Uh, and if you look here on the right hand side, this is the uh, vertically pointing radar data. And we see uh, fairly tall uh, reflectivity returns with some, uh, some indication of melting level in there as well. Now after 10 UTC, uh, it switched completely to warm rain. And so here on the left side, we see lots of small droplets being measured by our uh, distrometers. Um, and then here on the right, we have very shallow uh, radar returns from these, uh, from this MRR. So let's focus on that uh, warm rain period. Now here on the left is a precipitation uh, accumulation map from our control simulation. In the middle here is the uh, SBM, the, the bin model. There's a huge difference here. So here on the right is the difference between the control and the SBM. And what we notice is that the SBM is producing far more precipitation along the coast where we noted all of that warm rain in the observations. So potentially the SBM scheme is doing something uh, better. Compared to observations, same story. Uh, so on the left here is uh, observations minus the control and all of this blue indicates under prediction. Then here on the right is OBS minus SBM, and it's a much better forecast. We're still under predicting in some places, but overall, uh, that under prediction has been dramatically reduced. So back to our cloud water distributions, um, through our, through our you know, investigations, uh, we realized that the SBM scheme tends to distribute cloud water in a log normal fashion with a fairly large width. And so what I'm showing here on the left are uh, cloud water drop size distributions over this uh, dashed region here. And the black line is from the SBM. The green line is a gamma distribution matching those same parameters. And then the blue is a log normal fit. And so with this log normal distribution, we much better capture the behavior of that uh, bin model. And this matters. And the reason why this matters is because uh, log normal distributions, just like we saw in that previous slide, tend to have a larger tail towards, in this case, uh, what would be larger uh, cloud droplets. And so if you have more large cloud droplets in your system, uh, we can sort of hypothesize that that would result in, in, in an enhancement of warm rain processes. And so what we went ahead and did was add uh, log normal cloud water distributions uh, into the Thompson Eidhammer microphysics scheme. And so to do this, uh, so here on the right, I'm just showing a few of the, the equations that uh, represent the, the drop size distribution, uh, our, our uh, parameter uh, D sub N uh, of that distribution, which is the, the median diameter. And then the other parameter is sigma, which is the width of the distribution. And I'm happy to discuss this one later if there are any, any questions. So basically, we replaced all of the calculations of, of droplet size, number, and mass uh, with their log normal equivalents. So we swapped with gamma and, uh, and log normal. And then we changed the uh, auto conversion uh, in the scheme to uh, account for this, uh, since the auto conversion relies on drop sizes. Um, and uh, this uh, paper from uh, Nickerson et al. in uh, 1986 actually does a great job of, of uh, doing all that uh, hard work for us. So uh, we used a lot of their, uh, their formulations. And the results of that are shown right here. So what we have here are those same precipitation maps during the warm period. Here on the left is the uh, SBM scheme or bin scheme. In the middle here is the log normal scheme as we'll call it. And you know, those precipitation totals are remarkably similar now. And then here on the right, I'm showing up at the top, the log normal minus the bin scheme. So we've reduced the under prediction along the coast and Five along minutes. some of the terrain that we noticed in uh, the uh, control simulation. So these results are also similar when uh, ice physics are enabled and uh, further similar uh, depending on uh, different aerosol configurations. In terms of surface microphysics, uh, what I'm showing here are just some box plots at that same observing site on the coast. And uh, here on the left is number concentration. And we notice that the log scheme and the SBM scheme both produce larger uh, number concentrations uh, relative to the observed, but still definitely more 
uh, in line with, with warm rain. And in terms of liquid water contents, making these changes to the Thompson scheme results in a much better uh, liquid water content uh, simulation than the control run uh, had. So now we're looking at some long-term evaluations. Uh, so we're looking at this uh, extended period from uh, November through the end of December in 2015, which encompasses most of the campaign. And we had a wide variety of environmental conditions during that period, as you can imagine. And so uh, here I'm just showing some precipitation accumulation maps at individual stations that we'll be using. And, you know, unsurprisingly, the log normal and the control really are pretty similar because we're sort of averaging and, and summing over all of those environmental conditions. So we're going to find the warm rain now. And to do this at each of these stations, uh, we're computing the uh, melting level from the model and the depth of the cloud above the melting level, which can be negative if the clouds are contained entirely uh, below the melting level. And so on the next slide, I'll be showing some plots of uh, melting level on the vertical compared to the depth of cloud above the melting level on the horizontal. And so it, it essentially creates this uh, parameter space where we can identify where warm rain is occurring. And so when you do that, you get uh, a plot like this for uh, differences in rain rate. And so this is the log normal scheme minus our uh, Thompson uh, Eidhammer control. We have melting level on the vertical, cloud depth above the melting level here on the horizontal. And the colors here indicate the rain rate difference um, for those, those given conditions. And so wherever you see the blue color, that indicates that the log normal scheme is producing more precipitation. And that's contained largely below, uh, you know, with, with clouds that are uh, less than or uh, equal to about one kilometer uh, in depth above the melting level. So uh, we've really uh, honed in and improved warm rain uh, simulations. And then above that, where we expect more mixed phase clouds, we sort of have a, a much less coherent signal in, uh, in, this, in this space. And uh, the last slide that I have here shows uh, just that we have an increase in rain mixing ratio uh, here in the middle, uh, more raindrops, and a decrease in raindrop size with the log normal scheme. And so all of this is to say that we've produced rain now that is actually more characteristic of warm rain, having smaller drops and more drops uh, in the volume. And so I'll end right there and leave up some conclusions and uh, uh, hopefully have time for a question. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we probably only have time for one quick question. Uh, there is one on Slido. Uh, in my experience, precipitation is underestimated at the coast coastal mountain ranges uh, in Pacific Northwest, but overestimated in the lead. Maybe topography or resolution plays a role? That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, what we found in our work is that uh, topography and resolution do play a role, uh, but for warm rain cases, uh, it doesn't really matter what the resolution is. Um, or the resolution of the topography that it still under predicts uh, precipitation. And in fact, if you take the log normal scheme up to a, a higher resolution, uh, just above a kilometer uh, in horizontal resolution, it actually uh, produces a, a much more reasonable forecast, whereas the, uh, the control experiments that we showed uh, still, still really struggle to produce the same amount of precipitation. Okay, thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, we have to move on. Our third speaker is a veteran in our microphysics field, uh, Jason Milgram uh, from Environmental Canada. He will talk about the P3 scheme applications uh, for research and uh, operational NWP. Here we go, Jason. Hi, Lulin. Sorry, I'm having technical. I can't figure out how you share the screen again. Oh, share screen. Uh, at the green bottom. Button. Yep. Yeah. Stand by. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm new to this whole um, using Zoom and such things. Try, I'm yeah, try presentation uh, Okay, uh, can you see my screen okay? Very good. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot. This is my first uh, War of Empaths workshop, so I'm uh, kind of excited to be here. I might seem like I'm a bit out of place, given that I work for a weather center in Environment Canada. Um, let me explain. So I work in the Meteorological Research Division of uh, ECCC. One of our jobs is to build and maintain the numerical models and modeling systems that are used by the uh, Met Service for Operational NWP. So several years ago, Hugh Morrison and I hooked up and we started, we, uh, we started working on, on researching uh, microphysics parameterization. And it's pretty, been a pretty good um, sort of symbiotic relation because we, did, we ended up a few years ago developing this new microphysics scheme, P3, which um, is now used operationally in Environment Canada. And of course, the exact same code is in WARF. So it works out very nicely because uh, when people in, in a WARF community uh, find bugs or make improvements, we benefit from that directly and vice versa, I think. Um, so I'm gonna give a, a, a quick overview of P3. In particular, I'm gonna to try to motivate this question of when you've got 97 microphysics schemes in WARF or whatever it is, why would you want to build a new one? Give a brief, brief description and then discuss some um, um, sort of major developments that have been done since in the last five years since we built the scheme with some applications. Um, okay, so Hugh covered this, this topic. The basic punchline here is cloud microphysics is complicated and the way you model it, the degree of detail that you um, represent in your microphysics scheme affects the forecast. It affects the way cloud optical properties uh, are computed, affects the uh, um, effects on buoyancy and of course precipitation. So in bulk schemes, uh, we typically represent uh, hydrometeors by one or more sort of typical quantities and then parameterize bulk uh, um, growth and decay processes. So uh, several years ago, Hugh and I compared uh, each of our respective uh, um, detailed two moment schemes in WARF and we were surprised at the time to find how differently they behave in terms of producing uh, supercell simulations. We assumed that they, since they were complex, of comparable complexity, that they would give um, uh, very similar results. After doing some digging, we realized that it really depends on whether or not you bias the scheme towards grapple or hail. Uh, and this is what sort of put us on our sort of track of, of looking in more detail on grapple and eventually realizing that the whole traditional bulk approach of predefining, of using, uh, of partitioning the hydrometeor spectrum, uh, the ice spectrum, or ice, to, uh, ice population of ice rather, into predefined categories is, uh, is has some inherent uh, bad aspects. Uh, in, in uh, Hugh discussed a bit of those, but in, in particular, the, the, this, these conversions between category, which are a completely ad hoc, and fictitious process. There's no such thing as conversion of snow to grapple with an, above, an abrupt jump in, in properties. Uh, so rather than continuing to do um, incremental, trying to make incremental improvements, we, we decided we need to explore the idea of just completely abandoning the notion of predefined categories. And so we, we developed this approach in which we use what we call free categories. And if you have one or more ice phase categories, with the predictive information on, uh, on the physical properties, emphasizing the uh, physical properties, which can grow continuously. Uh, so P3 stands for the predicted particle property. Um, okay, so after this was all started in about 2012, the ICCP did some scratch on the back of the envelope. Uh, the following summer, uh, finished up the, the plans. This is in the middle there, this is a, uh, uh, literally the drawing board in Hugh's office. And then later Hugh wrote the first uh, version of the code. Um, and then we, then that was ready for testing. And the left is sort of the initial proof of concept. Does it look reasonable in, in an idealized wharf 2D squall line? Yes, it did. Put it in a more complex case of a semi-idealized 3D squall line with observations. Look very, look very good. And then, uh, and actually at the time, this would have been 2014, we were sufficiently connected with the, uh, with the CAPS group at Oklahoma University, and they allowed us to put in, to include uh, in their spring experiment that year, this, uh, this beta code, if you will, and ran it in real time. And actually uh, it, it did fairly well. Um, in comparison to other schemes on the left, that's that semi-idealized squall line, uh, it, 
uh, it did, it does sort of comparably well to other other season schemes. And again, on the right, this is in that uh, 2014 uh, spring experiment. Um, you can see my mouse, eh? Uh, notice that I'm uh, acknowledging that this case is sort of cherry picked. They're not all this this favorable for P3, but one systematic conclusion of the 2014 experiment and other years was definitely P3 was an equal contender. But the significant point isn't that it's better, is that right off the, right off the shelf, it, it was just as good as, as schemes that were um, that had been developed and tuned in war for many years and so forth. So what we what we built initially as a proof of concept ended up, re we realized quickly that this is actually, uh, has potential use in operational NWP and possibly beyond. So um, the liquid phase component is nothing particularly exciting. It's sort of a standard, if you will, two moment rain, two moment cloud. Um, although I, I forgot to put up here, we soon will have an optional third moment for rain. The ice phase, the way the ice phase works, is we have a user specified number of categories uh, of so-called free categories with as few as one category. And then between four and six prognostic variables, uh, mixing ratio variables from which you can uh, compute various physical properties. So there's actually three different mass mixing ratios, deposition mass, rhyming mass, and liquid. Uh, it's double moments as number concentration. Volume mixing ratio allows you to compute the uh, rhyme density. Uh, um, and then optional triple moment gives you spectral dispersion. And we also have an option now for the subgrid scale uh, cloud fraction uh, so that it can be used in uh, larger scale models. So um, those, the choice of prognostic variables was made specifically so that we could, we could focus on the ev evolution of various physical properties. And if you have these physical properties, you can then diagnose particle types. So it's not that P3 does not have grapple, it just doesn't have something that's predefined as, as medium density grapple. It, it's all that it depends on the predicted uh, property. Uh, and I'll show an example of what that means in a moment. So the conceptual basis for this is, is this Heinz field uh, conceptual model in which you have an initiation of a you know, pristine ice crystal uh, with high bulk density, which then grows by vapor diffusion with a mass diameter uh, relation with an exponent uh, close to two, and then it, can, it may or may not undergo aggregation. And then as you have partial rhyming, the coefficient uh, increases, the exponent uh, continues to be around two until you get to the point where it almost completely rhymes and then uh, changes to three. Uh, and then the grapple density, can, uh, the, the density continues to be uh, uh, possibly to vary. So there are between one and four different regions of the size distribution with different applications of these, of these uh, mass diameter uh, relations from which we also can uh, use corresponding area diameter relations and then compute explicitly the, the, fall, the sedimentation, uh, uh, the fall speed for a given size and so forth. So the way that in bulk schemes you compute a, uh, a, a moment uh, based on a, a, a process rate. And also it's the same process for computing other physical quantities like uh, optical, uh, optical properties, vector radius and so forth, is you take the, you know, the, um, uh, it, it is related to basically specific moments of the distribution. So in terms of the mass growth rate, you take the mass growth rate for with a given particle of size D, multiply it by the size distribution and integrate it. So in the case of sort of traditional bulk schemes, which you have fixed properties, these quantities are, are analytical, uh, analytical, but because we have up to four different regions of, uh, uh, with different mass diameter relations, you can't solve it analytically. But it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It means it's computationally expensive, but in our case, we turn that into an advantage because we pre-compute everything in, uh, in bin space and store the results in lookup tables. And so at runtime, the, the uh, accessing these is actually extremely fast. Uh, so this is uh, another illustration of what I was referring to, that even though we don't have a, a property, uh, predefined categories per se, you can identify a, a sort of familiar particle type. So if you take a look at where the diamond is, um, F rhyme is the rhyme fraction. So it's blue, uh, very little, very low rhyme. So it's all deposition mass. 
uh, very low density, ball speed around one meter per second, uh, mean mass diameter of uh, five or more millimeters. So you could define that as an aggregate, for example, and so on. So, th and this simulation is with, with a single category. So you can see that it's a continuously evolved, a continuous um, uh, in space and time physical properties. And so, it, so you can have a, a wide range of particle types. So this is uh, switching back to, to up north. Uh, th this is our uh, 2.5 kilometer uh, NWP system, sort of a little bit similar to the HER, except we don't have a rapid refresh. It's run uh, four times a day, 48 hours. So initially we set this up as an experimental system in 2014. This was using the milbrandt yao scheme at the time. In 2018, it became operational. And with that, we did actually switch to P3. So since then, we've been using uh, P3 operationally in this system. Um, and we expect to continue that into the future. Um, so here's an example now that, uh, going from idealized to sort of more actual NWP. So this, I mean, this is a hindcast simulation with the specific configuration of P3, but it was just the, the version of the, ski, of the P3 that was changed. So there's that, uh, um, a squall line simulated south of Chicago or something like that. And if you zoom into that, do a horizontal, do a vertical cross section. So on the left is, is the reflectivity. So that's a pretty good reflectivity structure uh, for a squall line. And this is when it, within the operational system, just sort of with, with no tuning, except that for this experimental version of P3, which happens to have a, a triple moment. Uh, nice transition between the convective region and the, and the Stratiform, including the notch. What's missing, of course, is, is we don't have a nice, clearly defined bright band, but stay tuned. Uh, we, we don't have the liquid fraction in this, in this uh, case. And this is uh, on, on the bottom left, it's another way of looking at the, the various particle types that can be, uh, can be obtained. So this is just a decision tree um, from the prognostic variables and so forth in order to break things down into uh, familiar particle types. Um, um, so the, 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 the limitation in this configuration, though, is since there's only one category, we can only have one type of particle in a given point in time and space. So it makes it hard to model processes like rhyme splintering, for example. Uh, however, I'll show uh, later that with uh, multiple categories, uh, that's overcome and there are benefits. Um, okay, so looking at a few aspects of the behavior in P3 in, in, the, uh, uh, in the operational model, Going, jumping back to, uh, to our second paper in which uh, one of the case studies we did was this improved two case, uh, a cold frontal system passing over the Cascade Mountains. Um, on the left, I guess is the precipitation. Uh, I think that, oh yeah, the rain gauges and then the continuous uh, shading is from the model. So right along here, I guess is the Cascade Crest. And one of the things that came out of the improved two study was there was a wide range in distributions for different microphysics schemes of where the precip would land in terms of the mountain crests. And that had a lot to do with the treatment of grapple versus snow. And so it, this is a, a cross sections from the P3 simulation. So you can see that, okay, so you've got the ice moving from west to east. Uh, there's uh, forcing for upward motion. You get, you get the liquid water pockets. And so as a result, you get rhyming. And, and, and then increase in density. And although you probably can't tell uh, from the colors, but along with these increased in density are increase in fall speeds. And so this is done gradually. It's, there's no abrupt transition from snow to grapple. So in improved two, the schemes that would, would uh, over predict the precip upwind were the schemes that were, uh, had more strict conversions from, no, the other way around, uh, that would favor grapple, would, would precip, would, would uh, would fall out sooner. Those that fa favored snow would, would uh, transport horizontally uh, further. Uh, anyways, we have observed that benefit uh, systematically in, an, in the HRDPS in the West Coast. So this is on the top left or top right is you know, uh, uh, the HRDPS domain. I think this, these clouds are from a different case. I just wanted to show five minutes, the geography. Please. What's that? Five minutes. Oh, shit. OK. Uh, so, but anyways, the point is that we, when we switched schemes, we had uh, a, a systematic uh, reduction in the overprediction uh, downwind of the mountains. And this is largely anecdotal, but it is systematic. Uh, 
Okay, so since then we've made um, a handful of relatively major, si since the original development of the scheme in 2015, made a handful of, of, of fairly important uh, developments, generalizing the scheme ooh, first to multi-category. Um, um, a PhD student in, in Montreal put in this prognostic with refraction. Uh, a postdoc at PNNL uh, uh, put in a triple moment rain, which we do not yet have in the official version, uh, but, but we are gonna get that in soon. We've got a subgrid sub cloud fraction, and then we recently put in triple moment ice flying through uh, some of the implications of these. Um, secondary ice production is sort of a big new topic in ice microphysics. And in order to model uh, ice multiplication you properly, you definitely need more than one category. So this is an example from a high ice water content simulation from my colleague, Xi Peng Q in 250 meter gem simulations. This is the four category configuration. Um, in high ice water content, one of the things that was or the problem that we're was trying to overcome was pockets of very high ice water content in the upper troposphere with relatively low reflectivity. So you would, the problem with the models over that is that it was uh, underestimating the number concentration of particles. So just skipping to the punchline, once we put in ice uh, secondary ice production parameterizations, it definitely matched the observations better in terms of number concentrations and um, improved the reflective, reduced the reflectivity a lot. Um, hail, we've got, uh, we recently adapted our uh, ice to be triple moment. Um, Lillian, I'm going to beg for an extra five minutes. Is that okay? Otherwise, I'm going to have to basically I'll, skip. I'll, so. I'll give you more, two, three, two, three more minutes. <laughs> I'll try not to ramble. Target. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, everybody. Okay. So, at any rate, the, the punchline here is in the original scheme, the uh, uh, P3 lacked hail signatures that uh, this uh, student in Oklahoma University uh, noted with uh, uh, dual pole signatures, a dual pole radar simulator. So part of the reason was that in the two moment version, we control size sorting uh, of ice by putting a fairly strict uh, limit on the maximum size. With three moment, it controls size sorting much better. And so as a result, we don't have to have this limit and we can simulate hail better as a result. Uh, Mixed phase precipitation, allowing uh, prognostic liquid fraction. Uh, this has important implications for winter uh, winter precipitation, certainly in the uh, um, area that I live, where we get a lot of freezing rain and so forth. But here's an illustration of the effect. You can see that we now have a bright band and an improved uh, uh, reflectivity in the stratiform reason as a result of the fact that with the prognostic uh, liquid in, in ice, we're actually having better simulation of, uh, of melting uh, and so forth. Large scale models, we've got a, uh, a subgrid cloud fraction, just jumping maybe to the point here that uh, the gray is the cloud fraction. You see when we put in the subgrid cloud fraction, we get clouds earlier and we have subgrid scale clouds precip earlier. And actually things compare better to satellite radiances. So you can see the blue is, uh, uh, low brightness temperature, so it's excessive cloud shields, upper level cloud shields with the south, with the cloud fraction version in that increase improves that. So all that to say, uh, we've been, uh, we've had a, a few major developments going on and we're still in the process of really trying to exploit those. And from my point of view in, in, in Environment Canada, the emphasis being on improving the uh, uh, numerical guidance of high impact weather elements. Um, We've made a few sort of, uh, a few advancements, uh, some impacts in the community. Uh, the, I, I think one of the first one is that we did, after a bit of struggle initially, convince the modeling community that uh, the abandoning the concept, the paradigm of predefined ice categories really is the way to go. When we first presented this at the uh, Cloud Physics in 2014 in, in uh, Boston, everybody just sort of shunned us. But after a couple of years, uh, this was in fact the bullet point at the end of the cloud model workshop in Exeter. Uh, it's been implemented into about nine different models. Uh, I should do the inventory a bit better. Uh, um, George pointed out that L uh, the same model can be an LES or a CR uh, cloud resolving model. But at any rate, the point is that it's, it's in models ranging from LES to GCM. There's been several uh, PhD uh, topics for this. Uh, our first few papers have had a lot of hits. Uh, I looked it up uh, the other day and we've actually got 449 references. 
uh, more than half of them are due to the part one paper, which actually won this NCAR uh, publication of the year award. Excuse me for being immodest about uh, advertising this, but still quite proud of this. But the other point is, I think that a big part of this was that within a relatively short time from initial concept to actually building a tool that was used operationally, uh, replacing the existing tool um, in a relatively short time was, uh, was something we achieved with this. And within Environment Canada, not just in the 250 meter uh, run, uh, um, a 2.5 model, 2.5 kilometer model, but we're actually currently adapting this to be used uh, on all scales uh, and all of our different uh, gem-based systems. Final note on cost, I'll fly through this. If you take a look at a category by category cost, I'm a little bit more optimistic than Hugh was in terms of the, the, the numerical cost and bulk schemes. Um, and, and I think it's there's evidence to be um, optimistic, ironically, because of the paper that Hugh wrote. But uh, if you look at just, a, 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 for example, a Thompson scheme uh, in this configuration, seven categories versus not to pick on the Thompson scheme, but this is the total runtime. It's about 17 per 16% cheaper uh, for, for the exact same number of categories. So the scheme, the code itself is cheaper. But as, as Hugh mentioned, the, the advection of, of tracers, microphysics tracer is a huge cost in microphysics schemes. However, um, there is this technique which has not really been exploited enough in microphysics of, of called scaled flux vector transport in which you don't have to evect all of the tracers, but you evect uh, uh, a, a lead tracer and then for double moment or triple moment categories, the, the extra evection cost is significantly reduced. Maybe I'll just conclude at that, but the whole point is just that there is hope for these, and P3 lends itself very nicely because especially for ice in which you've got up to six tracers per ice category, you don't actually have to have six six times the advection. There's a little bit of cost for advecting the slaves, but it's actually quite, and not nearly as much. So this is something which um, I, I really recommend the wharf and maybe impasse community to, to consider putting in. Um, anyway, finally at my conclusions, and I apologize for taking so long. Um, first point, the property-based approach, and I don't mean the P3 scheme, because as you pointed out, there are a handful of other schemes that are using this. It is definitely, I think, the way forward it's, as a conceptual and practical step forward uh, above and beyond the traditional category uh, approach. Uh, specifically, P3 has been shown to be quite versatile in a wide range of uh, conditions, although we're still working on, on that. It hasn't been tested yet for mixed phase Arctic clouds, for example. And uh, to reiterate what you concluded on, that due to the scientific uh, gaps in understanding of natural cloud physics, uh, all schemes, including P3, still suffer from the same limitations and, and approximations, AKA guesses. And so really to move forward in uh, NWP and uh, representing cloud microphysics and models, it's not just increase improved techniques, but basically more research in fundamental cloud physics is required. And for the, those of you know, that know Hugh, you can ask him why the duck is our, our, uh, our mascot for P3. So with that, I'll say go Avalanche. If you make it through Las Vegas, uh, Montreal Canadiens will be happy to take you on. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, sorry, we're a little bit over time. We have two questions on Slido, but I think uh, uh, your slides already address one of them in terms of uh, whether P3 can be applied to a uh, larger grid spacing. And one quick question I will hope you can answer is, have you or anyone else tested the performance of P3 for tropical convection, uh, convective systems, especially including uh, tropical cyclones? No, no, I have not, I myself, I've not done any work with tropical cyclones. Uh, my, my colleague at EC, ShipNQ, has been working on the high ice water content case, which is tropical deep convection uh, in, uh, in French Cayenne. But he's looking at that in a very high resolution situation. We're looking at secondary ice production and we're, we're, we're running at 250 meters so that we can remove all doubt that we're in cloud resolving regime, or well, not all doubt, but uh, the doubt that would exist if, if we were running it to, at uh, NWP type resolutions. So, and we're, uh, and we're running it with four ice categories. So we could answer the question, I don't know the answer to the question about the performance, but I don't think it would be that relevant. I, assuming that the uh, answer or the question is motivated on uh, performance in an operational setting. 
but I can just make the general comment. I mean, I don't think that it really matters on the type of case. We've, we've looked at it for hailstorms and it, it perform, it's, it's fairly efficient. Can I, can I quick jump in here, Lou Lin, just really quick? Sure. Uh, I do know of one group that's actually using P3 um, right now, but they haven't published anything yet. It's sort of ongoing research. Um, Ryder Fox, who's a grad student of Dave Nolan's at the University of Miami, is running P3 for, I don't remember which storm, something, one of them that hit North Carolina a few years back. So I guess the, the answer would be stay tuned. Great. Yeah, Thanks. one Thank of the you. nice things about getting it in the community model is that people use it and then give you feedback and... Uh, Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think we have to conclude our uh, session and I would like to give a round of applause to all our speakers and also our uh, workshop organizers for their great work and great job. So I'll hand it back to Wei and uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, yeah, thank you for staying with us. I hope you all find something useful from the workshop. Uh, I don't know if Joe uh, Clamp is still on the uh, in the I'm meeting. Yes. Okay, you want to say something uh, to end uh, to close the meeting? Uh, I don't have anything specific to add. I also uh, thank you all for your participation. I think even though we were doing this in a virtual format, we still had uh, a good interest and in, in good. Uh, uh, participation. Uh, if anyone has any uh, burning uh, questions uh, that they don't feel got uh, sufficient attention or uh, more general questions on issues we didn't cover, uh, you can, uh, we could certainly entertain those. Otherwise, we will draw it to a close. Yeah, thanks to all the speakers and the chairs who helped. Uh, to conduct this workshop too, yeah. Okay, well, hopefully we'll see many of you in person uh, in 2022, right? That's what we all hope. All right. Thank you. Bye then. Bye.